Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Londonderry Town Council meeting for July 10th, 2023. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing for a moment of silence for all those men and women who serve us here and abroad in the military services and in protection of our country. Thank you. Okay. All right, so council, we have a long agenda tonight, so we are going to stay on point here. So. Um, I'm going to start with uh, public comment, presentation of a rabies clinic check. Birch, our wonderful band director, was going to be here tonight with his son, um, but since we're first and so early, you know, but when they do get here, um, Deb and I are just honored to um, donate to the London Dairy High School Band, um, not us donating it, but from the rabies clinic that we held in town, helped many um, dog owners out, even a few cats, and we raised just a little under $1,000. Special thanks to um, Dr. Myrna Gregorio of the London Dairy Vet Clinic. She's donated her time the last uh, three years for us and all of the rabies vaccinations. So um, Deb was there working, um, Carol from our office, many volunteers too. And um, it was great, Deb, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, wonderful. It was really wonderful. So this, all of this money will go to the band for their trip to London coming yeah. up soon. And, and next year we'll have it again. And um, hopefully we'll make even more money. So special thanks to everyone. And <laughs> Thank you, and thank you, Dr. Myrna, who always volunteers every year to do that. Uh, next item I have is for Steve and Julie Lee for the Londonderry Concerts on the Common. Okay, he's controlling it. Hi, my name's uh, Larry Casey. I'm the chair of the London Area Arts Council. Steve and Julie will uh, update you on concerts on the common in, the mi uh, in a minute, but I wanted to take uh, just a minute to provide an overview of what the concert or what um, the London Area uh, Arts Council is involved with. Our uh, mission is to enrich the quality of life here in London Area through the arts, and we've been doing that for many, many years through a variety of programs. And just to hit uh, some highlights in terms of what's going on right now. Uh, for many years, we've had a featured artist program next door at the library. If you go into the art library and walk around the uh, window areas around the perimeter of the stacks, you'll see uh, art on display every month. We have 12 featured artists uh, throughout the year. We uh, held our uh, Arts Cafe this spring, which is, brings together artisans, artists, and musicians for a day of relaxation and enjoying, uh, enjoying the arts. That was held at the Orchard uh, Christian Fellowship Church in April. Um, during COVID, one of the things we tried to do was virtualize our programming um, uh, because of the quarantine situation. So one of the things that we came up with was a uh, virtual youth art contest uh, with three different age categories. But uh, the youth of our community uh, submitted artwork, uh, scanned it, uploaded it, and it was uh, juried and judged by uh, art teachers and we continue that uh, program. We'll be kicking that off in uh, September when the academic school year starts. We have a new program that we're working on in collaboration with um, Alona Arndt and uh, the Senior Affairs Group. Uh, in fact, uh, this Sunday we'll be holding a second senior jam uh, for the love of music. That'll be at the um, uh, Senior Center from uh, 2 to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, I was away uh, for the first one, but my understanding is we had 10 musicians show up for a jam session and we had over 60 seniors from the community um, at, in attendance at that. Uh, the other thing that we're going to be starting uh, this year 
uh, with a hopeful launch date of uh, next spring, is a literary and art magazine uh, digital format. We're looking to get people who uh, have writing talent and visual arts talent um, to contribute to this. It'll be, you know, juried uh, uh, contribution, and we uh, we're excited about that. But we want to open up our programming to the written word and also give uh, an opportunity and a platform to people that are doing fine art and photography. So that will be coming. And uh, I've already spoken with Mike Malaguti about, you know, how we go about doing that in, the, in a correct way and make sure that we're um, not only complying with uh, legal requirements, but making sure that we're in accordance with, you know, community standards in, in terms of taste and content. So I just wanted to say a few, few words before Steve and Julie come up and talk about Concerts on the Comet, but I also want to thank uh, the board, John in particular, for his support, everybody in the town administration uh, for helping out with Concerts on the Common and uh, the Arts Council in general. Uh, we appreciate uh, not just the moral support, but the finan financial support as well to uh, further our programs. So I'll turn it over to Steve and Julie to talk about Concerts on the Common. Um, Steve and Julie, if we can just pause for a second. Um, I guess Serge just walked in the room and they want to present him the check real quick. So if we oh. could uh, if we could do that for just a second and uh, you know if you could just bear with me and I'll let the ladies uh, do their thing. The money will be put to great use for your trip to London, so we wanted to make sure that we could awesome. do what we thank did, you so and much. to the council. <laughs> so, no, we thank you for all you do for the LHS band. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Always want to help out the band. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm Stephen Leas, my wife Julie, I'm and here. we'd like to thank Larry. Larry's also the chairman of the uh, London Darius Council, along with helping, working with Julie and I on um, the concerts. So just kind of a quick rundown, an update on where we are. Um, we sent you some um, documents, uh, just our opening remarks that uh, we have every week. It lists all of our sponsors along with the program we gave you, those has a, that has the sponsors on there also. And then also um, some narrative questions that Larry has answered that are pertinent to the uh, grant we get from the state every year. And, and I think if you read those, it, he really does an, an excellent job, just an incredible job explaining the mission and purpose of the, of the concerts. And that kind of is wrapped up in our, our tagline, which is uh, community, great music, and summer evenings. Yeah, with a real emphasis on community. Um, we've been doing this, this is our 23rd season, and along with the concerts, we also roll in uh, making sure the bandstand is in, in, is in good shape. We get a lot of support from the town on that, obviously. Um, but some things we've done over the years, uh, the stone facade was put on, um, the stage and the tree LED lighting, and then we also make sure that it gets uh, painted regularly just to make sure it uh, stays in shape. Um, some successes last year, uh, some highlights. Uh, the concerts are extremely weather dependent. So if we're not having good weather and we move inside, attendance goes way down because it's not a concert in the common. But we have found that it's just the best way for us to manage the bands that we're programming and such to have the concert. And just makes it simpler in the long run, frankly. Um, but last year, we were outside every week, um, and so, some sketchy some nights, but we had, the average, was, average attendance was over 500 people, so it was uh, quite high for us. Um, this year's looking good, but we've been inside two concerts already, and so those were way down. So our average isn't as high, but when we're outside, the, um, the audience is, is looking very good. Um, our... Funding, well, so we have uh, um, funding from uh, the town, gives us funding. We get uh, do a lot of fundraising through sponsors in town. Um, that takes a lot of time in uh, the spring and getting into early summer. Um, and then we also get a grant from the New Hampshire um, uh, Council for the Arts. We've, I think we've had that two or three years now, and that's something that Larry and um, Steph Maville uh, 
uh, lead getting that, and it's a lot of work to, to get that every year. Um, we also have a lot of community partners, uh, the town, obviously, the school district helping us with um, when we have to move inside. They're just great, uh, making sure that we have a stage, and they help with um, things like lighting and things like that. Uh, the police, fire department, DPW. Um, this year we have the volunteer alert organization helping with uh, uh, directing parking, which is great. Um, we also have the churches supporting us. Uh, with parking and such. Uh, we have vendors, food vendors, um, different uh, exhibitors that come to the concerts, and again, trying to just draw in um, different aspects of the community to expose people to different things that they could get involved in or just enjoy. Um, one thing we'd like to point out is the value of the concerts. So our free concerts allow individuals and families with limited means to enjoy a picnic supper, uh, you know, really in a beautiful setting while listening to what we hope to be exceptional, exceptional music performances. Uh, and it's an experience that might otherwise be financially out of re reach for s some folks. Um, if you compare going to like Tupelo or the Palace, uh, in our grant, grant uh, proposal, um, we estimated that the average ticket price for a comparable performance at a uh, Tupelo or a commercial venue like Tupelo or the pa Palace would be about $29 based on the level of talent that we book. And so over the course of the typical 11 concerts that we have in a season, that would represent a value of um, almost $1,300 for a family of four. So uh, we think that, you know, there's a lot of you can see from the slideshow that uh, a lot of people like to take advantage of that, and um, th I think that's really great. Uh, the funding's approximately a third from the town, and the remainder is really from the uh, New, Hampshire, New Hampshire Council on the Arts and um, from our local business sponsors, who we really appreciate them uh, pitching in every year. And um, we also, uh, a f two or three, three or four years ago, I think now, we took on um, finding the, uh, s supporting the artist uh, that's playing on the old home day concert. Um, and so that, that money now comes out of part of the, the fundraising and everything too. We added uh, that 11th concert. The Wednesday night, kicking off old home days. Yeah, kicking mm -hmm. off old home days. So that's kind of it. Mm -hmm. Questions from the council? Yeah, please. Do you know on average what you're looking at for people this year right now? Uh, so if we discount the going into the schools, because mm -hmm. uh, it's That's really not the same variable. thing. Um, we've been, uh, I think we're, I think the high school is 250, 60, something like that. Uh, the next concert outside was 461, and the co next concert was actually 462. Mm -hmm. So we had a little increase there in that last concert. Wow. So you're staying so close to your 500 on average. Yeah, and, yeah. and again, it's weather dependent. I think when it's e consistently every week outside, mm. people kind of get into the habit of it. Mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. even though we've been outside, it's been very hot. And so I think that that dissuades some people to, to go when it's that hot out. So mm -hmm. uh, again, it's very weather dependent. And we're looking at uh, 90 degree day. Yeah, for Wednesday. To off for Wednesday. We're going to be so outside, be, so hallelujah. Yeah, but <laughs> Uh, it's going to be hot. Yeah. But that concert usually draws over 700. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, that, not this one. The, the, the ones. Um, neuronic. Uh, gumbo. Neurotic gumbo. They, they draw a big crowd. Yes. The ones that were over 700 were 750 was, um, let's see, it was well, the Beatles. The Doobie Brothers. We had a Doobie the Brothers, Doobie Brothers cover last band. cover band. And then uh, I think it was a Studio, and, and studio 2. The Beatles, the Beatles band, cover. Which we have for the old home day kickoff. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Right. And they're back mm -hmm. this year. We also have um, two other bands that have drawn a, we can kind of gauge it somewhat on our Facebook uh, page because that's kind of our main line of communication with folks. And the interest that, uh, the bands that are getting the most interest would be Foreigner's Journey, and they were really big when they were la here last, uh, right before the pandemic. They were, so we didn't we, even hand yeah. out tickets at that one because we just kind of gave up. Um, so that one, we're going to have a lot of people. And then also, we have a Linda Ronstead cover band. Um, and the woman that's singing is, uh, she was a finalist in um, American, American Idol. Idol. Mm -hmm. So, and we've that's heard. Drawing a lot of yeah, it's drawing a lot of interest. Well. That should be really a lot of fun. Well, I think they're one. playing a flying monkey the same week. Oh, really? That I just picked Ronstead? that up in one of the. Uh, okay. 
So <laughs> we aren't, uh, yeah, we have to be careful how we advertise that particular one. I, I just so. happened to see it yesterday. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it should, it should be a, a great concert, yeah. It'll be a lot of fun. Hope for what? No yeah, so hope, hopefully they're not playing in the cafeteria. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm. I'm always very upfront about that, but I bet a lot of these people have n haven't played in a cafeteria for many years. <laughs> so. so you're advocating for building the dome. Oh, that'd be <laughs> wonderful. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. We're there. Anything else from the council? Uh, thank I, thank you much. for what you do. Well, thank thanks you. for your thank support. You yeah, yeah, as you guys know, I mean, I try to get there whenever I'm in town and Absolutely, everything. You yeah. do a terrific job. Yeah. Enough can't be said about Concerts on the Common. Enough can't be said about Larry and Julie and Steve and the and work all they of our do. Volunteers. All the volunteers yeah. that are there. Yeah. Yeah. The alert tonight. team, yeah. the police and the fire department. I mean, it's a really a great thing for the community and everybody comes together. But it wouldn't happen without the three of you. So thank you. All right, so it's, it's everybody, really. So, but thank you very thank much. You very Thanks much. for your thank support. You. Thank we appreciate you. it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we have a public comment next. We have 16 items on our agenda tonight. We're going to be limiting public comment to three minutes, and I'm going to be keeping things to about 20 minutes tonight, and then closing public comment. So, whomever would like to come up first is more than welcome. Good evening, Mark Oswald and Holly Ann Winslow, 11 Verde Lane, for Hearthstone Drive. It's more fun on this side of the desk. <laughs> <laughs> We're just here to ask uh, your continued support for the leadership program. We started 20 years ago. We've had 17 classes. We've had 255 residents go through the program. As someone said early on, it's rumor control. Hmm. It's a great opportunity for our fellow residents to understand how we govern as a community. And uh, an opportunity too to just thank the consul and the school administration, the school board for their support. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication on the part of the department heads, police and fire, DPW, town clerk's office. I know I'm leaving people out, but uh, <coughs> hope that you'll consider supporting the program again for this year. Yeah, I think the council's aware we will mm -hmm. Council will probably continue to support it so that the council is aware the town manager has been having conversations with him and asked for a little bit of, um, I, I'll call it breathing space, so that he can get his staff up and running. And I, I guess you, you all are communicating with each other, so we'll right. kind of leave it to all of you. But I, I think the council support remains 100%. the same. Absolutely. Yeah. You guys do a great job. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else with public comment? <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. I just wanted to uh, come to you tonight to update you on uh, the question that was brought up a few months back in reference to the, the uh, Chief O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in reference to the uh, apparatus that we have that contains the uh, firefighting foam that contains PFAS. Um, so, as I told you the last time I was up here, I had received word from the uh, State Fire Marshal's office last fall that they were going to be doing something last fall, and nothing ever came to fruition to do that. Um, I have since contacted a cleanup company um, to see what the estimate was going to be to basically get our systems flushed to recapture what we have on the apparatus and then to be able to replace it with the new green foam that's out there. And that's going to be somewhere around a $30,000 bill. Just so happens the day after I got this estimate, I got another notice back from the State Fire Marshal's office and I just spoke to Sean Toomey last Thursday and the state is now going to move forward with the uh, reclaiming of all the foam that these fire departments have. Uh, our closest site is going to be uh, Nashua, so we'll have to evacuate it from the, from the vehicles and take it over to Nashua, and we're supposed to be getting more notification from the state in reference to what this procedure is going to be to give us a guideline on how to do it, what are the best practices to do it, and uh, I'm hoping to see that, he said, probably within the next two weeks. So I just wanted to let everybody know that we weren't kicking this can down the road. I was just trying to do my due diligence to save the taxpayers some money, knowing that this was going to be offered by the state and just was waiting to, to get a response from them. So that's the latest update. I will update you further, or somebody will, in reference to when it is, uh, when we go through the process of uh, getting evacuated and cleaned up and, re and reclaimed. But that's the, uh, that's the latest update. Thank you, Chief. Thank You're you. Thank you. Thank 
Richard Polinski, 89 Hall Road. I'm going to bring something to the attention of the people of Londonderry that the town is aware of. And before anybody wants to beat up the messenger, this is information. It's information that came from the town. It's information that people, some people know and others don't. Later on tonight, you'll be talking about the old Perform Alliance Hall. What I'm talking about is the fact that as far as I'm concerned and the people I've spoken to, if the town is making any efforts to get back the $80,000 that they expended on repairs on the Lions Hall, that we were not responsible as taxpayers because per their lease that they originally signed in 1972, they were 100% responsible for all maintenance, repairs, upkeep, inside and outside of the Lions Hall. That was the reason they got it for a dollar a year. I'm also in, I have some information that came from a Lions member and went to another Lions member I now have a copy of, that they have $80,000 sitting in a Wellington account, and that they also have $16,000 in donations that was made to them by Home Depot and Benson's for renovations that were needed on the building that they didn't use it for. And that this member actually quit the Lions Hall over this and some other issues. And what is the, what is the town going to do to try to get the taxpayers $80,000 back? The money came out of the maintenance trust fund. And as far as I'm concerned, and I have all the invoices here, the invoices, the dates, how much, and everything. It came right to me from the town. So this is what it is. And I'm sure some of you up there are aware of this. One, I don't know why it was ever done. I understand it's a town building. They say they couldn't afford to do it. But they had a lease. After the first time, they couldn't afford to do some maintenance to the building because they couldn't afford it, if that's the true case. They were in violation of the lease, yet it went for years and years more, they were allowed to do the same thing and came running to the town. This individual even says in here they had the money, yet they still just asked the town for money. I can give you the names you want, but I think that part's irrelevant. <coughs> so the people need to know this. We're going to be talking later today about what you you know later on in the agenda about the Lions Hall and what we we'll, you know may or may not do with it, and what needs to be done with it. Maybe some of this wouldn't have been done of when they couldn't afford to do the repairs originally. The town had terminated the lease. That's what you do with the lease. That's why it's in the lease. And this isn't hearsay. I can read the lease right here if you want. I got the whole thing. Apparently, the last lease, actually, from what I can see, never even got signed. So they were in there a few years with, with an unsigned lease. So obviously, you can't do anything today. But I'd like at the next meeting, or the, you know, the meeting after that, I don't know when the next one is, if it's in two weeks or a month, I'd like some answers. And I don't, you know, the answer I don't want is, well, it's a town building. They couldn't do it, so we did it. Because that's not an answer, because this is a lease. Thank I you, have sir. a real estate Your license. time has expired. Yeah, my time's expired. Your time's but expired. But you don't have any rules, John, because you didn't vote Your them time in. Your time has expired. Your time, you did sir, not vote them in out of within Your time is 10 days of the sir, meeting like the charter Your requires. Time expired. And when the people were sir, talking you are about the order. concerts on the conflict, it was also over sir, five minutes. last warning. Uh, you know, John, I You're don't care your warning your is. Time you is have expired. to do and pay the consequences. Your time has expired. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment, please? <clears throat> Ryan Mead, 555 Mammoth Road, The Village. Um... With the proposal of two apartment buildings going in at the Mammoth Road, Page Road, Grenier Field intersection and further development in North Londonderry, I wanted to bring the dangers of that intersection to the attention of the town council. I have a uh, traffic safety committee meeting minutes uh, dating back to April of 2015 discussing the dangers of Mammoth Road through the village and the dangers of that intersection. Um, I'm gonna try to respect the time. Um, so this is from April 6, 2015. 
From 2000 to 2010, there have been three accidents. From 2010 to present, which is five years, there were 10 accidents. And I had um, some numbers put together. At one point, the town installed some dynamic stop signs that would flash as they uh, recognize vehicles approaching either north or south. Those work part of the year when there's enough sunlight because they're solar powered. And uh, during the winter, they don't work at all. Um, and so at the time that I requested these accident reports, um, I went back the same amount of time pre-installation as post-installation to get you know the number of accidents at that intersection. Um, and there was a difference of six with more before the dynamic lights were put in. And so that was 14 accidents at that intersection from July of 2019 until January of this year. And I can tell you we've had three uh, in the six week period of April, May and into June. Um, serious accidents, vehicular accidents, some involving, well one involved a uh, motorcyclist. It's an issue, um, as the uh, fire chief said, uh, that has been kicked down the road. The can has been kicked and kicked. In one of our recent traffic safety committee meetings, Bob Ramsey said that he's been on the committee for 30 years and this has been an issue for the whole time he's been on that committee. Um, I don't think that there's any way that that intersection can handle any more traffic, any increases in traffic um, with its current configuration. A lot of the issues, uh, and we have video that I've shared with um, the town manager that you can you can see the accidents occurring and all of them are from people going north or south on Mammoth Road. Uh, we live right at the intersection there and what we have proposed is that that road be dead ended with a gate. Um, we've proposed speed tables to slow the speed because the, the signs don't work if you're looking at your phone. Oftentimes people will pass you by the senior center if you're going 30 miles an hour um, because it's not fast enough. That road is used as a cut through to avoid the lights on 28. So um, if I, I actually attended the meeting that you were at in which you um, were discussing this, um, the um, I think what the council probably needs to do here is in these type of situations is ask the town manager to direct the police department and the fire department to come back to us with um, with additional information around, sir, if you can't be quiet, you can leave, okay? Um, to come back to us with additional information around the accidents this gentleman has spoken about, let's get some feedback for, you know, um, for what they have seen out at the intersection and then see what it is we can and we can't do to address it. Part of the issue is it's a state road, so there's only certain things we can and we can't do. So, um, Which one is the state road? The Mammoth Road of the Village or the Page Road, Grenier Field? Road. Well, it's, it's Page Road, Grenier Field, but it feeds into Mammoth Road, which is the state road where the traffic light is. Okay, so Route 28. So I'm not sure. I'm, I want to get all the information sure. okay. for the whole surrounding area. So if, if, you, if the council's okay with the town manager asking police and fire to look at, so what we're looking at is, is the entire Mammoth Road intersection and the Page Road, Grenier Field Road intersection. Yes, you're, you're exactly right, Mr. Chairman, that um, the Grenier and uh, Rockingham Road intersection is a uh, state controlled, basically it's our driveway onto a state road. So you're exactly correct in that regard. Um, and so, you know, any changes that are made in this vicinity um, certainly need to be uh, run by DOT to make sure that they don't have an issue with it. But what I can tell you, Mr. Chairman, is I've um, attended at least uh, at least two, possibly three traffic safety committee meetings where there's been, I get, think, good progress made. Um, staff met for an hour this morning. Um, the videos and other input that's been uh, supplied by Mr. Mead and his neighbors has been invaluable. Um, we are going to solve this problem, and speaking for myself, um, um, but I think others on the traffic safety committee, um, I believe uh, that we're gonna be able to solve this problem, um, at least identifying a solution uh, a week from today at the next yeah. traffic safety committee meeting. Well, we'll look forward to, a, to an update at the next town council meeting. This is all great information and I'm, I'm glad that you're engaged and working with the town. I do want to just uh, remark here, I am excited about that as well um, and hopeful 
in January of 2018, we sat in a traffic safety committee where the Stonehenge Hardy Road intersection was turned to a four way intersection. Um, the traffic safety committee, uh, they approved that. And the previous town manager, um, when we brought this intersection up, he said that the Page Road, Grenier Field, Mammoth Road intersection was a, a greater danger and needed to be fixed than the Stonehenge and Hardy Road intersection. So forgive me find, if, if I'm not optimistic. Disagreement here. So, so right, thank, thank you, you for bringing it to our attention and we'll have you, well, we'll get some feedback for you by the next council meeting. Thank, thank you very much. John, yeah. you, thank you. We have our DPW director Wolf in on this. Um, remember the town manager believes it's necessary to get us an answer. So, yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, some of my staff may not appreciate that I'm, I'm getting out in front of them on this, but um, to be perfectly clear about the solution that I am talking about, I intend to make a motion uh, on Monday evening to, uh, to gate off that uh, section of the roadway. Thank you. Jonathan Esposito, 5 Shelley Drive here in Londonderry. Just want to briefly address how public comment is being conducted. Uh, prior citizen was cut off. They didn't have the opportunity to fully finish their thought. But as they correctly pointed out, according to the town charter, uh, the town council at its reorganization meeting within 10 days of the town election was to take that opportunity to vote in any rules of order that they wish to adopt. As the citizen who was speaking prior did not have the opportunity to finish, this session of the town council did not vote vote to adopt any rules of order. We're not trying to be contentious. I'm not trying to be a disruptive citizen. That is simply a historical fact during your session of the council. So we appreciate that you're trying to keep things moving along in an orderly fashion, Mr. Chairman. But the three minute limit is especially arbitrary considering the fact that the original limit was five minutes for several years prior and you inappropriately cut that time down by two minutes again for years. Uh, so really you should be trending in the direction of allowing citizens more time since you whether uh, unintentionally or not denied them opportunity in the past. I'd also like to speak to the fact that the gentleman who was speaking specifically addressed a topic on the agenda, which is what you've asked us to try to stick to before. We all know that when the Lions Hall is discussed later this evening as an agenda item, that it's not a public hearing, and we know that you will be banging that gavel and you will not be entertaining public comment. You will, in fact, shout citizens down. So it would behoove you to give folks a little extra time to speak to a topic on the agenda, even if it goes over your extreme arbitrary three-minute limit we would appreciate if you would conduct public comment in a little more citizen friendly manner and please get that look off your face you're clearly disgusted with my remarks but I'm a citizen I have the sir, right to be here and order. speak sir. sir thank you mr. You're chairman out of order. I'm not out of you're order out of mr. Order. chairman you sir, can continue yourself sir order. thank you sir you're out of order thank you mr. chairman sir you are out of order I will have the last word sir thank you so with regards to the rules of the council both gentlemen are wrong the comments for the rules of the council stand as they are. They're wrong about the charter. So let's continue on in an orderly fashion. Again, wrong about it. Please proceed. Uh, Ray Burson, 3 Gary Drive. Um, I just, just want to um, ask, uh, is it okay to speak as something that's gonna be on the agenda? Of course. Okay, so in, in regards to the Woodmont Common Development Agreement, uh, that the town and uh, Pillsbury Realty and the others um, with the POD have an agreement. Uh, but the, the agreement uh, has been modified a couple of times. Um, and even the Woodmont um, development uh, master plan um, is, is, is a, a vision but can be changed all along the way. Uh, in particular, uh, my concern in this is in regards to uh, both the water and sewer. And uh, I believe uh, they're gonna be coming forward to speak about uh, their plan that apparently the town has already agreed and signed. Um, and now we're just bringing this forward uh, to the public uh, I, I think this needs to be uh, discussed uh, further, particularly when we're looking at uh, a lot of development uh, outside of Woodmont. And by the way, um, when one of the other gentlemen spoke about the village, um, 
as part of that, uh, I believe the town is talking about bringing sewerage up, uh, I think, to uh, Mr. Evans' property uh, along um, Rockingham Road. And um, in this development uh, agreement here, uh, in regards to uh, Woodmont, um, I think we, we, we got to consider all the other impact that the town is going to be dealing with in regards to water and sewer. Um, it's fine, you got the POD, you're trying to work with Woodmont, um, which uh, can be beneficial to the town, but um, we've got a lot of other issues, and uh, as far as the $4 million that we were fortunate enough to get from the federal government, uh, pretty much that's being used for the Woodmont project. I, I, I would suggest we need to look at the rest of town and how we're going to deal with um, water and sewer in town. And we do have a utility committee, and I think the utility committee needs to be fully engaged in any of this discussion uh, with Woodmont. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Um, Representative Wayne McDonald, 11 Dickey Street here in Londonderry, along with Representative and tonight Councilor Dunn. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the state budget we just recently passed. I know that finances are a critical part of our community. I want to congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, and the council for your efforts at working to expand the tax base, uh, economic development. Uh, doing everything you possibly can to keep taxes under control as we try to do at the state level. Um, I, I've talked to staff recently. Uh, I can tell you that we passed a $15.2 billion budget, uh, but more importantly, what does that do for Londonderry? That's, that's why I'm here tonight. That's why you're here tonight. That's why the folks behind us are here tonight. Um, legislative budget assistant is unable to give me exact figures uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, all categories, for example, as, as they relate to education, uh, don't have estimates yet, and the, the agencies um, ne that need to compute the data to distribute the funding, uh, some of that information isn't going to be available till the end of the fiscal year, um, and they're going to, you know, they're going to be you know, keeping us up to date on that matter. But I can tell you that um, in terms of the total education grant for Londonderry for fiscal year 2024. It's going to be in the $11 million range and also in fiscal year 2025. And also, um, when you add that to the hold harmless and the swept money, it's in the $18 million, almost $19 million range for both uh, fiscal years. In terms of municipal aid in general, and I can only talk about this more statewide, uh, the budget supports almost $2.69 billion in state aid to cities and towns over the biennium. And this includes approximately $2.21 billion in education, adequate education aid to cities and towns and public charter schools over the biennium, approximately $244.6 million in meals and rooms distribution to cities and towns, and over $105 million in highway aid to cities and towns. Fully funds highway block grants to cities and towns at $72.2 million over the biennium. And we were just talking about roads here a minute ago. Includes an additional $10 million in general fund appropriations, bringing the anticipated total to $82.2 million for the upcoming biennium. Provides $22 million for municipal bridge aid and fully funds the highway and bridge betterment program at $84.2 million over the biennium. And this is a snapshot, Mr. Chairman. I know time is limited tonight and I don't want to delay matters, but I just want to let you know that we're trying at the state level to supplement your efforts here at the local level and obviously anything that you need anything that we can possibly do. We want to work with the council and, and uh, serve the citizens of Londonderry. Uh, we all know how, what a special place it is, and we want to keep it that way. So thank you for your time tonight, Mr. Chairman, thank members you. of the thank council. You. Thank you. Thank anyway. Anyone else this evening? Oops. 
Ann Champa, 28 Wedgwood Drive. Uh, first, I'm going to ask you a question on something that was just brought up. Um, Chairman Farrell, um, the gate on which section of, of the road or what road in relation to that uh, re rezoning that's coming up, um, which section you want to gate off? Uh, that was his comment, not ours. Mm. Oh, who's? The gentleman who was up here was talking about gating it off. We were not. Oh, okay. Um, I also want to mention as a member of the planning board, I voted against the rezoning uh, for a couple of reasons because of the traffic and the accidents on that corner. Um, I would have voted for it if the second um, entrance and exit to the project was also on um, Page Road um, as it was in the first design go round of that project. But I was concerned about the traffic exiting onto old, old I'll call it Old Mammoth Road um, and onto um, that intersection because the intersection is so close in that area. Uh, anyways, um, the reason I came here tonight was to talk about um, the proposal to um, uh, do work on the, uh, what you call the Lions Hall. But I'd like to be, have it uh, more well known as um, Reverend Morrison's Meeting House in the own Old Town Hall. Uh, uh, Chair Chairman um, Farrell, can I pass out something to each member of the... Sure. Um, I can take it so she can come forward. Thank you, Ann. What I passed around to the town council and other folks that are Kelly and uh, Mr. Malagudi sitting at um, the front tables here was the, uh, a page from uh, Willie's Book of Nutfield. Um, George Franklin, Willie's Book of Nutfield, a gentleman who did a number of wonderful books uh, concerning Londonderry, Nutfield, um, and the surrounding areas when he was less than 30 years old. Um, I, the, what I shows is um, what you call the lion's hall, the large section of the lion's hall. It is the old meeting house. Um, this book of um, Willie's was published in 1895. And if you read the first couple of sentences, the old meeting house in the order in an order of building, this was the fourth in London Dairy, and although it was removed from the old site near the president, present res, residence of Frank and Hardy and converted to, into the present town hall 50 years ago, so that would make it 1845 approximately, it is still remembered with veneration by a score of people. Okay. Um, what they mean by the residence of Frank Hardy, near the residence of Frank Hardy, was Maxwell property on the top of the hill at the intersection with Hardy and Pillsbury Roads. It sat on that property along with its session house, and it was moved from there over the to the Mammoth Road. Um, let's see. And it describes it. Exterior appearance was that of a two-story farmhouse. The main door was on the south side, and you can see it on the two, the illustrations, the plan of the gallery, which would be the second floor, um, and the um, the ground floor level. Um, you have a vision. Imagine the, what was going on in that building back then, in uh, approximately 1769 when it was originally proposed and started. If that date sounds familiar to you, 1769, it's when the first parish church in East Derry was also built. So if you consider what's been going on at the first parish church in East Derry, or the meeting house, as they call it now, um, um, I hope you consider our building on Mammoth Road in Londonderry 
just as important to the citizens of the East Parish here in Londonderry as, it, as the one in Derry was to the West Parish. Uh, um, and uh, they've been, ha they've been, I'm sorry if I'm yelling, they've, but hopefully the people at, at home will hear me. Um, mm. They've been <laughs> having an, <laughs> without the microphone. Um, so Anne, we, been gotta, we gotta move things along. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, well, I got distracted by the first thing. They, um, they have, um, they had hired um, preservation timber frame to, an adu to do an assessment of, the, of their project, the church and the steeple. And um, it's interesting because we contacted the same people to do an assessment of the parts for the Reverend William Morrison's home that we have in the stored in trailers at the Morrison House. So I know Aaron Sturgis and his company very well because we got the same documentation of the building and the plans for reconstruction as they did over in Derry for their church. Um, so, so help me out, Ann. Where are we going here? Okay. <laughs> what I'm going to say, I hope this isn't, uh, for example, um, I read in the, um, where is it? Here, Weston and Sampson's uh, memo. I'm only saying this because I, I can't um, foresee the future of what's coming afterwards after I speak about this project. It talks about a new front porch and all that. The, that's on the front section of the building that was joined with Reverend Morrison's meeting house, which I'll call the Old Town Hall. So uh, with regards to the Lions Hall, we're just having a discussion tonight. I know. When, okay. But when it says... Whether, whether, whether or not we're going to allow them to use ARPA funds to go forward. Right. There'll be another discussion about what we're going to do. Right, I know, but I'm looking Tonight's at the time only, frame. It's I, two weeks and then four, me, four weeks for the I plans to be done. I just want you to think about, instead of uh, replacing the porch, which is similar, very similar to the ones that's on the Mac homestead, the front of it, which basically used to face the south, uh, south uh, to the farm, the farm stand uh, before Mammoth Road was built. Remember, that was only built in 18, was it 30? Um, 1831, excuse me, and the house pre, pre what do you call it, was there before it. Um, and also the Pils Colonel uh, William S. Pillsbury's homestead on Pillsbury Road, the same front porch. That's essential to the character of that building also. When they stay a new one, I could see it if it structurally isn't stable enough, but to remove it, that, is, to me, would be an abomination to this building. I'm sure once they get into the project, they'd welcome your input, welcome your comments, well, welcome your history. Well, I also want to say... I, I just... This, yeah, but we're not going to talk about the building tonight. But I also want to say I can't thank Jim, uh, Councillor Butler enough for inviting me to come over to see the... And, and um, Mr. Cotton, who was in charge of the restoration of the floors in there, to invite me in to see it. And uh, Jim and I actually climbed up into the attic mm -hmm. and took a look around. So I knew I'm very familiar with the building and its history. So I wish the Historical Society could have been, con I forgot to mention, I'm, a, I'm the past president and uh, curator of the Historical Society. I wish the Historical Society would have been um, uh, contacted about uh, possibly giving input into it um, before the plans were made. I think that might have been more helpful. And I want to thank you, for John, for, I should say, Councillor but for Butler, fine. forgive me a few extra seconds here. Ha happy to do so, Anne. I know you're passionate about it. I understand. But thank you. And you, you can tell I raise my voice a little when That's I okay. get excited. But I appreciate the time. How are we doing? Tom Esty, Old National Road, lifelong resident. Um, part of the charter, Section 3.2, organization meeting the councilors so chosen shall meet in their capacity as a council within 10 calendar days following their election for the purpose of taking their respective oaths of office adopting the rules and for the transaction of business required by law or ordinance to be transacted in such meeting 
Yeah. You're, you're applying the inappropriate portion of the, of the charter. We've already talked to legal counsel multiple times. Public comment. Well, this and, is in the, the charter. Excuse me. And the council can be run by the chairman at his discretion or her discretion. If they want to have 10 minutes, if they want to have an hour for public comment, it can be done at their discretion. They can be overruled by the rest of the council. That is the way the rules run. So we're not going to have this discussion anymore about rules. Those are the rules. We have public comment rules, and we're going to follow them. That's the end of it. So why is it fair for one person to get up and speak for 10, 15 at minutes? The but, comment, at the comment. The, the, but then you the give someone person, else three minutes? Well, I'm not going to stand here and argue with you about it. No, I gave him four and a half minutes. Okay? Well, now, please, what, whatever it was. And I'm, I'm not back. taking anything away from Ann either. Because you know what? I mean, if – Everyone in this room, I believe everyone's from, I think most of these people are from Londonderry. We're taxpayers. And you know what? And if we go over fun. five minutes, big deal. Who cares? And again, we have business to conduct. Those are the rules. You have to follow the rules. Does, does anyone have anything to say to me before I sit down? Thank you. No? Thank you. Okay. Marge Bedoy, Conservation Commission. I promise this will be quick. Um, in regards to the Woodmont's proposal, I just want to make um, known that the Conservation Commission um, took no official position on the Woodmont's pump station, mm -hmm. but we did recommend that it not be placed within the wetland buffer. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and unfortunately, the conditional use permit was approved over our recommendation, so it's there but my concern is that in the agenda here there's no map indicating where that pump station is located and um, we were told that 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 pump would be the only encroachment into the wetland buffer okay. that's it make sure somebody asks about it please thank you thank you all right this is gonna be the last comment we've already gone a half an hour Deb DeRochers <clears throat> excuse me 25 rural lane um, I had put this paper together to read to the uh, council and the people watching tonight in the gallery here uh, a couple weeks ago when we had an incident in our town clerk's department. And I thought since Sherry's uh, article in the uh, Dairy News brought so many people forward, came into our office, emails, everyone unbelievable, uh, telling us how they felt so bad of what happened. I'd like to read it tonight. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm not only a resident of Londonderry, but I also work here at the town hall in the town clerk's department. I have the pleasure of interacting with all departments here <clears throat> in the town hall. In my opinion, we have a fantastic group of people in this building that are friendly, courteous, and professional. We all do our part to provide good service to our town residents. In the town clerk's department, we see hundreds of residents each week. Recently, we had an incident, which was about a month ago, take place in our uh, clerk's office. Three individuals disrupted our business day for no reason other than to try and get footage to post to a YouTube channel. They call it auditing public access to government buildings. Londonderry was one of many towns that week in the state of New Hampshire and other states that these self-proclaimed auditors went to. As a side note, just so these, you can know, these people uh, that call themselves auditors are also referred to as frauditors by many other YouTube channels that make fun of them and post lengthy felony conviction records of some of them. These are disruptors live, live stream and record reactions of employees as they loudly go from department to department looking for one or two employees to berate and insult. I was one of them, proudly saying that. Every YouTube video is the same, same pattern <clears throat> of disruption, same berating insults. They're just uh, recorded at different government buildings all over. I have many other very strong personal opinions about these people, but this is not the time or the place to express them. I do, however, want to personally, and on behalf of my coworkers, thank our town manager, Michael Malaguti, and our town clerk, Sherry Farrell, for stepping up and taking the brunt of the insults and comments that these people fired off at them. 
My last comment is as a resident, not as an employee of the town. Londonderry is a great town. I am proud to live and work here. I am speaking for the many, many residents that feel as I do. We are tired of the same small group of people that are at these meetings over and over again, insulting the members of the town council, the town manager, members of the boards, town employees, and constantly saying that everyone is corrupt. We feel that these past and present town councilors, past and present town manager, past and present board members, and past and present town employees have and always will make decisions that they feel are in the best interest of the residents of this town. If you don't agree, run for office, get on a board, or come and work for the town. Thank you. All right, public comment is closed. We're gonna move on. Uh, right before we move on, um, you know, my mother taught me a long time ago, if you don't have something nice to say, probably shouldn't say anything at all. But you know what, people need to be uh, nice. They just need to be polite. If you come up and you make comments, doesn't mean that you're right. Doesn't mean they're facts. Doesn't mean it's exactly what happened, right? Public comment, you can say what you wanna say but it doesn't mean that's exactly what happened. So we're a great community. Let's act like one. Let's be a great community. Let's do great things and stop dwelling on the negativity that is just not necessary. So with that, let's go to a public hearing. I'll accept a motion on resolution 2023-13, open a public hearing for SCOBY Pond Boat Launch Grant Acceptance. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Public hearing is now open. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will be as uh, as quick as I can on this one. Uh, this is something that uh, Mr. Speltz from the Conservation Commission and I have been uh, discussing, but um, Ms. Bedoy, the uh, chair of the Conservation Commission, is here as well, and I'm hoping that she can back me up if I uh, get into trouble on any of the details. Um, the There is a boat launch, um, uh, but I think it is not a well-developed boat launch right now on Scobie Pond. Um, and the Conservation Commission has identified an opportunity um, to access some governor's office for emergency relief and recovery funding um, that is specifically designated uh, to allow the upgrade of uh, town and uh, city-owned boat launches. Um, there is a, uh, a grant program that requires a match uh, of 25% from the municipality. Um, this is a picture of uh, that area that I think everybody's probably familiar with down Scobie Pond Road. Um, this is what uh, these particular types of boat launches look like. Um, so we're not talking about um, you know, motorboats or, or anything like that. It's, it's something um, uh, for kayaks uh, and for folks to walk out there and enjoy the, um, the surrounding area. Uh, we have a quote for $25,529 for an all season dock. Um, uh, doesn't require a whole lot of maintenance and it doesn't need to come out of the water in the winter. Uh, there isn't much in the way of site work that is uh, required um, and you can find similar docks like this uh, in Auburn Village on Massapequa Lake. Um, there is a, we have uh, submitted a grant application. However, one of the requirements um, is that uh, in order to get an award, the town council has to specifically uh, accept the funding in an anticipatory fashion um, and agree that the municipality will take care of it. Um, the grant application that we have submitted is for $30,000, so just, uh, just under $5,000 higher um, than the quote uh, that I referred to from the previous slide. Um, the delta would allow, if, if awarded, uh, for limited improvement to the dirt um, and parking area. Um, the uh, town match would come from the conservation fund um, that is not uh, funded by tax dollars. It does not have a budgetary impact. Instead, uh, these are funds that come into that um, conservation fund through other mechanisms, largely through the land use change tax um, and the arrangement that exists for the um, allocation of those funds. That is um, the presentation that I have for you this evening. I'm not sure if there's anything that um, you want to add, um, Marge. Fantastic, thank you. Any questions from the council? Yes. Um, between you, Mr. Town Manager, and uh, Dave Hooley, do we see any potential repairs or maintenance with this type of dock in the future that 
may be needed for damage from weather? Um, I, I'm not sure if this is something that was discussed at the Conservation Commission. Um, I know Mr. Speltz has a lot of expertise in, in this area. Um, I can tell you just from uh, my limited discussions with him that um, this is something that we, we don't foresee as a large draw on municipal resources. Um, I don't want to represent to the Town Council that, um, that it will um, never require a dime um, in terms of maintenance, but that is something that could be worked out between the Conservation Commission and the uh, Town Government um, if and when that arises based on the, the need. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, real quick question. You had mentioned the fact that this dock is primarily only going to be used for kayaks and canoes. canoes. That's my understanding, yes. It okay. could also be used for canoes. Who's going to? Well, we all know what's going to happen. Someone's going to have either a motorboat or some type of propelled boat that's going to either probably hook up to it. And it, it, Will this dock be able to take care of that kind of abuse? Because it's going to happen. The other thing I have a question of uh, is adequate parking down there. When that goes in, that's going to attract more people. Mm -hmm. I believe that we've had problems in the past uh, with, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, uh, drugs down there, drinking down there, uh, and parking down there. So I don't want to, I'm not looking to put a damper on this, but that's reality. I'm familiar uh, with that concern okay. from my days as a prosecutor, um, uh, <laughs> Councilor Butler. Uh, I, I PD can certainly speak to that more. It's my understanding that yeah, it's down at Dark Road, uh, yeah. and it's a it's a nice you know place, secluded place that you know people aren't always going there to do uh, healthy things. Um, but uh, as far as the motorboat traffic on Scobie Pond, I I don't I don't know how how frequent that is. Um, Marge, I'm not sure if you have any. Uh, commentary on that? It's a public hearing. Yeah. Any motorboat that's on Scobie Pond is typically belongs to the residents that are there because there isn't a real good launch place yeah. for those boats to go through to be launched okay. um, on that very narrow section. Um, the other thing that this dock provides is a good place for fishing, mm -hmm. and that was actually a request of one of the residents on Brewster Road who was handicapped and couldn't get you know, out into the water to into fish. Water. So I think this will also address his preferences for fishing. Okay, thank you. So. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, Mr. Town Manager, are you able to pull up on a satellite map where exactly this will be located for those of us who do not know Scooby Pond? That's a good question. Councillor Combs, let me see if I can locate it. It's where that um that cleared out area is now, right? Yeah, I mean, like I believe it's right here. Yeah. yeah. So zooming out. You know, it's all it's not all by itself, but there is certainly um it's a you know it's an area there where the people use it as a turnaround now. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to address the council with regards to this subject only? Yes? And Champa 28 Wedgers Drive. Um, as knowing uh, a, um, a family that lives right close there, is, are the uh, residents who live in that immediate era go area going to be contacted about this? Is it may which um, entry point from Lenadier? I think they have a couple. You have a couple of them. It's only one entry one. point that I'm aware of. There's a piece of property, though, also that you own that's not to, connected to To get to, to that, this right? dock, there's only one entry point. Okay. There is a municipally owned 
uh, piece of vacant land in this area, but we would, we, to my knowledge, we would not be access. There would not be access through there. There's no access point through that piece of property. Okay, just because that would probably bring a lot more. Tra I don't know how much, but more traffic to the area for them to be yeah, aware of it, there, or maybe they can put their comments. To get to. In. Pardon? So if you've been out there, it's not an easy place to get to. Oh, I, yeah, I've been in, out there. Uh, it's not not an easy road to navigate. Uh, yeah, but my old van could have do, done it. You know, if you want to get there, it's a, by the way, it's it, w it was a, a original connector that went up to I think what is it weeks have off of Auburn Road, so um, it's got some history behind that. But we'll okay. Anything else? Public hearing. Bring it back to the council. Anything else from the council? So we're going to address this as part of the grant application and um, another item here on the agenda, right? Um, we didn't um, include a separate item, Mr. Chairman. Um, did in not include, usually you include a separate item for unanticipated revenue. Right. Um, there was, uh, so there's been some confusion about that in the past, and so we opted to leave it um, under public Terrific. hearing. Terrific. Then we'll do it right now. Single item. Then I will ask uh, for a motion to accept uh, the unanticipated revenue for resolution 202-123-13. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, what's affirmative? I'll accept the motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, votes affirmative. Public hearing is closed. Okay, next item. Next item is proposed funding agreement with Pillsbury Realty, Woodmont Commons for completion of Pillsbury Pump Station sewer infrastructure project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is something that I briefed the council on extensively, uh, probably in the last month or so. Um, and the problem that uh, we've been talking a lot about for a number of years is uh, a lack of uh, sewer capacity sufficient to fully build out uh, the Woodmont Commons area. Um, this affects other areas in South Londonderry uh, along the 102 corridor as well um, and has been um, an issue uh, that we've been trying to address um, for uh, a number of years. Um, there, um, from the earliest uh, days of the Woodmont Commons uh, negotiations and ultimately the development agreement and then the amendments to the development agreement, there has been an understanding that um, provisioning this area with adequate sewer capacity, water capacity for that matter, um, and other utilities would require um, a large measure of public-private participation um, and cooperation. Um, this is uh, something that uh, is the rule and not the exception with respect to developments of this um, scale and magnitude. Um, and in fact, the development agreement itself and then uh, the material amendments to it recognize this. I'm um, talking about uh, the use of public financing, um, public-private cooperation, um, collaboration between the town and the developer. Um, all of this is, uh, is fundamental to not only the development agreement and the various amendments, but also to the success uh, of the Woodmont Commons project. Um, we have uh, not, uh, contrary to something that was said earlier, not signed a, uh, an agreement with Woodmont Commons um, um, and then brought it in here for uh, the council's blessing. Instead, we have uh, negotiated with Woodmont Commons an agreement that I um, am comfortable recommending to the town council. Um, but it is the town council's uh, decision to approve or not approve um, this agreement. Um, the agreement uh, takes advantage of the fact that there has been an award of $4 million um, in community project funding um, secured through Congressman Pappas's office and supported by Senator Shaheen and the Appropriations Committee on the Senate side. Um, the total project uh, is estimated at $7.75 million, um, and this agreement reflects how the parties will um, come up with the delta. This agreement provides that the town um, will allocate $2.6 million from the Sewer Enterprise Fund. The Sewer Enterprise Fund, um, Similar to the conservation fund in the way that it is, uh, it is funded does not affect uh, the budget. It does not affect uh, the tax rate. It is entirely uh, funded by and replenished by user fees. Um, the Woodmont developer um, is proposing to bring $1.15 million to this project as well. Um, but importantly, will 
fund any excess over uh, the, the current $7.75 million um, estimate. As we all know, uh, construction projects are not getting uh, cheaper, and so the value of that guarantee um, should not be overlooked. Uh, this project also secures capacity uh, for areas outside of Woodmont Commons. Um, and in that regard, whereas the uh, pump station and infrastructure leading to the, the Manchester wastewater treatment plant uh, will accommodate 500,000 gallons uh, of wastewater flow per day, um, only just over 300,000 uh, gallons of wastewater flow per day are allocated to Woodmont um, under this agreement if adopted by the town council. Um, and so this uh, will allow us uh, to take advantage of the environmental benefits, um, but also the economic development opportunities to uh, put more of South Londonderry and the 102 corridor onto sewer. Um, I've heard expressed in the past that uh, you know we've done we've done X, Y, and Z for Woodmont Commons. Why why should we do more? Um, the success of Woodmont Commons is the success of uh, the town of Londonderry and the Londonderry taxpayers. And in that connection, I would like to point out one last thing. Um, the fiscal impact uh, analysis that is required to be performed under the development agreement every year uh, to determine what effect, what effect, if any, Woodmont Commons is having on uh, the town's bottom line uh, shows this. Uh, in the uh, tax year ending April 1st, um, and uh, with respect to the most recent fiscal impact analysis, uh, Woodmont was $2.2 million in the black on the town uh, tax uh, revenue side and $5.1 million in the black on the school side. And so I suggest to you, Mr. Chairman, um, that uh, just with the development that we've had in Woodmont alone to date, um, the community is receiving uh, uh, from Woodmont uh, just around $8 million in uh, cumulative um, revenue. Um, this situation is only going to improve um, if the town can cooperate with Woodmont to fully build out uh, the development in accordance with the master plan that was uh, gone over at such great length um, all those years ago. I'm happy to take any questions that the council has um, about this agreement. Questions? Yeah, either one. Uh, Mr. Town Manager, you say this is potentially going to be for 300,000 gallons a day for Woodmont. What do we see for the future if they actually need more than that? Um, 500,000 gallons per day is just about the maximum that uh, the downstream section of our sewer infrastructure uh, leading to Manchester can take. Right now, those pipes um, in the center and north part of town um, are only sized to take so much uh, wastewater. And so while we could design a pump station that would accommodate more wastewater flow in the area we're proposing that pump station to go now, um, the downstream uh, part of the system couldn't take that. Um, and We'd so have to improve more piping? We would have to improve that section of the um, system down the road. Okay. So the system itself, the actual pump, could actually take more than 500,000, but the pipes themselves could not? Right now we're designing the pump to accommodate 500,000 gallons per day. Um, if we wanted to um, uh, upgrade the system and uh, down the road, then the, the pump station itself would need to be upgraded. I will point out that um, the town's studies, um, including the facility study, don't anticipate a, uh, a greater demand for sewer capacity than this. Um, okay. So this is um, consistent with the town's planning um, and uh, management of our anticipated sewer um, capacity needs. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, quick question. You mentioned that it does not affect taxpayers. It's all going to be paid by user fees, correct? Correct. So where does the $2.6 million come in the short term? It comes from the Sewer Enterprise Fund, okay. which is... That's money we already have? Correct. Okay. Yes. Just making sure. Yep. Thank you. I was asked earlier, where's the pump station located? Um, yes, that's a, that's a good question. And, the proposed um, pump station. And, and I do have um, representatives of Woodmont Commons here. Um, I will... I'm, 
unfamiliar with um, the with Woodmont visiting the uh, Conservation Commission to discuss the wetlands impact of the pump station itself. Um, I can tell you that as part of the grant, uh, the federal grant funding, this is requiring a full uh, environmental study at the federal level. Um, but uh, perhaps they can speak more or Ms. Bedoy can speak more to um, the buffer issue that was just that was just mentioned. Um, it does appear that you know that perhaps there's there's some wetlands in this area, um, uh, but I just I don't have an answer for that question at the moment. Um, I can tell you that the pump station is uh, proposed to be sited, uh, and I also have uh, the engineering director here who will correct me if I get this wrong. Attorney Pollock, would you like to address this? Yeah. <clears throat> Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Council. I'm Ari Pollock. I'm with the law firm Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell in Concord. Uh, for many years now, I've been uh, representing Pillsbury Realty Development. They're the master developer of the Woodmont Commons uh, planned unit development. Um, to answer the immediate question, I, I think what may have been referenced earlier during the public comment period was the permitting that related to the water supply booster station that is to be located adjacent to Michael's Way. That did have an impact on a wetland buffer around Duck Pond uh, that was approved by the planning board. To my knowledge, the sewer pump station, which is proposed on the north side of Pillsbury Road, where the town manager has the cursor now, has not had any permitting done other than some conceptual diagrams, and that would all be required and ahead of us. Thank you. While I'm up here, could I speak more generally to the agreement? Sure. I, like you, get the question all the time, why isn't Woodmont Commons moving more quickly? It's what, what's there is great, but we want more and we want it faster. Um, there are plenty of reasons for the pace. Some of them are financial, some of them are market, some of them are supply and demand, some of them are physical. Uh, there's only so much water to be supplied, and that, again, was the genesis of the conversation for the water pump station and the arrangements made with Penichuk Water that went through the planning board for a, not only a, a tank project but a booster station. Sewer is a big impediment as well. Uh, the town of Derry's plant will only accept so much from London Derry, it will only accept so much from Woodmont, and with development comes waste, and if you want to develop and generate waste, you have to send it someplace. And as the door starts to swing closed, in Derry, uh, the door someplace else needs to open, and this is the, the next best thing. It's not immediately available. As you heard, there's a considerable amount of planning. There's a considerable amount of expense, design, construction, um, but with the town's great efforts, um, some serious f uh, financial support was obtained uh, federally. Um, we understand the sewer fund is available for these types of projects and Pillsbury is pulling its oar as well to the tune of a million plus. That's not all that Pillsbury is contributing. Uh, Pillsbury also has to have a station within its own properties in Woodmont Commons to pump up to the public station. If it's going to get uh, to an uphill area, it needs to be pushed there. Um, in addition, the air land area where the cursor was earlier um, requires uh, a dedication of land from uh, the Pillsbury uh, development uh, company to the town of Londonderry that's also on the table and part of the arrangement and so uh, everyone's putting in everyone's getting out there's a significant amount of public capacity uh, generated uh, in this uh, arrangement and of course it allows the vision of Woodmont to move forward I'm happy to take any questions but I'll keep it short I do have anything I do have a question maybe more so for Miss uh, Mr. Malaguti so um, the, the land that the pump station is on, would that be leased to the town of Londonderry from? So that would be um, secured by way of easement granted by Pillsbury uh, to the town in favor of the town of Londonderry. Okay. Our, our discussions have been a perpetual easement. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So that's at no cost. Correct. Okay. And then to just donate to confirm, uh, 4 million from the federal government, 2.6. Mm -hmm. 
from the tower uh town sewer enterprise fund and then the developer um has committed 1.15 at plus least any at least correct exactly plus any overages yes um that there might that might incur correct thank okay. you so from a time standpoint the longer this is delayed how does that affect now well that's a great question and the current answer to that question yeah. is we've been playing a very nice shell game of moving pieces around the board to make sure that the things that we want to see happen sooner than later are fit into the current budget of what goes to dairy okay. but you're right we'll we'll hit the wall yeah. we're hitting the wall and this is what moves the wall downfield so that we have more development opportunity What's you, the you have to put it someplace What's the time frame for construction? So we're looking to bid this uh, at the be uh, s sometime over the colder months. Begin construction um, next season, and it's a year's worth of construction from start to finish. Thank you. So that including an RFP process and yeah. acceptance, and, and that's an aggressive yeah time, that's, time that frame. is very aggressive. And that means if that if we hit that wall, it's going to take a year to put that in, and that means these gentlemen, the, the developer. It's going to be another two years before you actually see something and that's what I want to make sure that the residents understand that You know as this progresses it, it's also going to take uh, Some time for the developer to a get customers in there or get other uh, p Builders in there that are interested builders aren't gonna Builders aren't gonna buy the property or lease the property if they don't have access to sewer and water yeah. so This could delay it even further and I know there's People have complained at all. All we see is mounds of dirt and 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 and, and empty fields. Well, if we don't get this thing going, we're going to see that longer than you think. That's reality. And myself being a non-attorney, is there might be a dumb question, but is there a sunset to this agreement? Like, say the project <laughs> takes longer um, than anticipated. Um, could. could like my concern is that the the 1.15 plus the additional funds say say things take longer than anticipated and that it, there's an expiration to the contract no uh, place and I think attorney Pollock views this the same way that I do um, there the, the last opportunity that either side has to get out of the agreement is when the bids come in yeah, okay. um, and at that point it becomes a binding agreement going forward um, with, with with respect to both parties gotcha. I agree thank you anything else uh, thank you yes all I got to say is Mark. thank you mr. town manager for going through this whole process with the document and going through the legal battle back and forth between the, the state congressman and the developers That's, I think very <laughs> impressive Thank you, Councillor Combs, and I appreciate the council's support and the close cooperation with uh, with Woodmont Commons as well. All right, I accept the motion to approve the funding agreement for signature. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Your vote's affirmative. Please move forward. Okay, let's see. Hold on just one second here. So if you're here for um, pickleball, if you let me get through this next agenda item, I'll bring pickleball forward. Okay. So um, next agenda item is the ARPA funds for ARPA fund request for the Lions Hall conceptual. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Mr. Town Manager. My name is Dave Wally, Director of Public Works and Municipal Facilities, and I'm here to discuss what I uh, consider to be, after discussions with the town manager and members of the community, the next logical progression uh, and step in addressing the Lions Hall. Um, as you've heard some concerns expressed here tonight, and I've heard many over the course of the last uh, year or so that we've taken possession uh, as we approach that since last September, um, you know, there's great passion for that building. It has served this community uh, for a great number of years, decades, and, and, and arguably even centuries. Um, and, um, and some of you may have noticed, as uh, the town manager brings up a picture of it, we've done some um, cosmetic 
appearances out there to kind of clean up the curb appeal and the Christmas tree corral has been moved, which was uh, partially controversial, uh, but most people understand it and um, it's been, we've gotten many, many compliments about uh, how well it looks now with that removed. Um, so uh, just a little bit of recent uh, history. Uh, last October, we did uh, a very a good analysis of the building to basically let us kind of understand without getting uh, too aggressive and tearing walls apart and whatnot, but you know, from bringing in different disciplines of engineers to take a look at that. And we've got a pretty good handle on the fact that the building is salvageable. Um, it is in, uh, in not in modern standards as far as ADA compliance, electrical uh, needs, HVAC. So if we are going to purpose it for any municipal use, uh, there's a lot of upgrading that needs to, to take place with the facility. And the challenge there is, is that we have a facility that has a lot of emotional con connectivity. It has some historic um, history to it that is very valued. And so how do you mend the two together where you meet today's uh, you know, standards for, to be, have it open to the public, but yet preserve the history and the historical look of the building? So without having a specific useful purpose for the building, there's lots of ideas and there's lots of groups that have interest and lots of people that have interest. And it's gonna you know, be a managing challenge for the town itself if we go down some of these avenues. But what we need to do is look at, at least conceptually, have a vision so that when we do get into actually drafting plans, we are not, that's not what I'm requesting here tonight. But the engineers have a good idea as to what it is we want them to try and give us pricing to. Um, and, and like you know, the, the, the previous presentation, you know, time is of the essence. Uh, this building is extremely old, and when you leave a building that old, vacant, for some time without the water on, heat turned down low, air conditioning turned down low, uh, things can deteriorate pretty quickly. We've seen uh, some rodents move in there and uh, some paint peeling and things of that nature, and that will only worsen as time moves on. So we're trying to move this project forward in a respectful, timely manner uh, and listen to everyone's concerns and uh, you know, criticisms of what may or may not come with the facility. Um, I will tell you that in my discussion with Weston and Sampson that uh, I, I apologize if, there, if there's some language in there that is a little confusing, but anything, any renderings that we bring forward, there's not gonna be any real changes to the uh, view. We're not uh, anticipating saying, let's put on a farmer's porch or something like that or change the appearance in any way. We, we are kind of looking at ways to make that facility with some great alterations and whatnot, and perhaps relay out of the parking lot or entrance thereof, so that we can eliminate some very costly um, mechanical needs as far as access. Uh, ADA and getting someone to that first floor, I think people would all agree we don't wanna have some kind of exterior um, you know, elevator, um, we're looking at doing some landscaping that would make uh, the curb appeal certainly more, more eye-pleasing and really attract and, and draw some curiosity to, to the uh, facility. Um, it has been used by the community. I think you know, a Londonderry Community Center is something that is certainly in need. That's certainly the, the way that it has been utilized for, for a great deal of time, uh, whether it was managed by Alliance Hall or, or whatnot. Uh, even before that, it was used as the town's town hall, and, and as Ann um, appropriately pointed out, it was a, a meeting place, a place that Londonderry could come together and, um, and talk and, and, and you know, have conversations and have ideas thought out. And I think that this, this building can still serve that purpose um, for a lot of people in town. So the idea is, is to work with Weston and Sampson to embrace uh, some of the ideas that I've been hearing about, some of the uh, sentiments that the town managers re received as well, I'm sure you folks. And um, you know, we'd like to kind of get some of that down, a general layout, a look, it's something that things can be more critiqued. Um, there is an aggressive timeline in here. I, I, I kind of demanded to them that I wanted them to hit the ground running real fast if this is approved tonight, and come back to me within a month so that we can kind of look at it 
move it around and then bring that before the public and, and you folks as well, obviously, um, to say, no, that doesn't look good, this doesn't, that. and then, so at least that way we, we kind of have an idea if we move to a design, if that's uh, the, what, what the town chooses to do, we, we can kind of move things in a, a, a better way a little bit quickly uh, instead of then, you know, arguing about paint colors and things of that nature. So that's not really what we're, we're, we're looking to do here. It's, it's more of a general layout. Um, in my discussions with them, uh, a lot of my conversations was pre preserving that building or even perhaps, um, and this is where, you know, I'm, I'm sure the historic committee would be excited to help us, um, you know, bring back some of the, the, the glamour that that building actually still does that's hidden underneath the suspended ceilings. There's a lot of things that were kind of put in there because that was the construction materials available at the time and the cheapest way to go. Um, but there's actually a very unique curved ceiling to that Lions Hall, believe it or not, um, that you can see when you enter that access uh, attic space that um, um, people have climbed up in, myself included. So um, that's what the presentation is for here, uh, request rather, uh, for $18,750 um, to work with Weston and Samson, continue work working with them. Um, and uh, you know, I, to, to the request, um, the town manager thought it would be prudent to um, take that allocation out of ARPA funding for the town of London Dairy. And if you have any questions, I can go yep. yep. forward. Uh, what is the uh, what is the balance in the ARPA funds? Uh, I would have given a uh, an approximate, but two million four hundred thirteen thousand. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. All right. Thank you. Um. Do we see going forward spending potentially more money than this with Samson? It's a great Western question. Samson. So um, I, I understand the value of a tax dollar. Uh, I myself live in town. I'm a taxpayer myself. Um, I think the allocation that we did previously in October was around the same amount. It gave us a pretty good handle on what, that, what the challenges are with that building. I think this next step um, helps us kind of solidify that I, I don't think you can find a person in the town of there that says they want to get rid of this building no that's not what I'm saying uh, I'm, yeah. what I'm asking is do we think that they may be tacking on more money eventually down the line or is there are they well, sticking to these numbers so after the conceptual I mean usually you kind of do these things all concurrently mm -hmm. um, we're taking modest steps in that direction but yes a design after this the next phase is a design now we can do it one of two ways we can say we want to do a design next now that we have a conceptual idea of what we want to do mm -hmm. then they can go and make that a reality and they can design around around that blueprint around that look if you will um, if we they, they believe that from what they already know of the building and from what we do here we could potentially um, say we've got a good ballpark on what it would take to make that a reality. So we could do the design and the build in the same warrant allocation that, we, that we'd want to do. Um, it's aggressive um, it, it, because, you know, the construction industry is pretty tough to predict right now what's going on. With I'm just uh, I'm impressed with the numbers considering, you know, working in the construction industry myself, how uh, cheap they're willing to put on this project for architectural, civil, and uh, landscaping design. Yeah, it, it's, this is not a design. This is just going to be basically, you know, some, some appearances, measuring that building up. It'll help them in their design for sure. They'll know exact square footage. Uh, we're not going to do a certified, you know, plot survey or anything like that. That would be part of a design phase. Of course, okay. But this will get us some good visuals that we can bring in and, instead of then looking at street view as we are now um, and understanding, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about is, for example, in the front left corner office of that building, if you will, it, it probably w served as an office one time. That's where the vault is still remains from when the town hall used it. And, um, but all the HVAC equipment is in there. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not logically a good spot. So we've been talking about, you know, what if we move the mechanicals to the back, small addition off the back? What if we put the kitchen back there? Things of that nature, and what would that mean? Um, what would that entail? That would allow us more room in the lobby area to do uh, the ADA compliant bathrooms that we need, a downsized uh, scale of a, of a, a call in an elevator, but not your traditional style elevator that you see here. It, it, it allows us to not have that on the exterior of the building. We're only going two floors rather than land grade, first floor, second floor. So 
those are the types of things that we want to try to show that this is what we could do to keep costs down. I don't think we want to build a $10 million community center here, but I, I, I think this will get us a good round ballpark number as to where we could be, and then we can see if the taxpayers support that or not. Uh, in the end, I'm still very impressed with the numbers that they were providing. The, they, I, I beat them up pretty good. They, I, I, I want them to stay conservative. Mm -hmm. um, they're excited about this project. Um, I know we have discussed L-CHIP stuff. That's been thrown at me, too. I've worked with L-CHIP. Uh, it's a long, tedious process. It's an important one, but it's more if you're really going to make it as a – they don't want to – L-CHIP doesn't want to get into making a historical property into – a town community center that's not kind of doesn't jive too well and it's it's sometimes it drives cost uh e extensive because of uh, the types of materials that they want you to use and, and whatnot you can't have vinyl siding you you can't do things like that so right and yes quick question dave yep. um would this opera money be able to be used for any of the structure you mentioned like the foundation and the structure you think you can we can repair it would any of uh, that money be able to be used to fix that? Because I know that's a concern. Well, this this ARPA request is no, just not this one. The, the, the money that we have, the two million. Would any of that in the future? Well, that, the, the, I, I don't I don't think so. I, I okay. well I, I don't know. I, the, the financing of it that's 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 above my grade. But you know, I would, would think you're looking at more of a Warren article for right. something like that. It, it would be much more appropriate to take yeah. it to the voters no, just, and, and let them yeah. decide whether or not they want to fund you know this type of a project. It really would be up to them. I think this was a good start. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, one thing we do know is in these historical properties, when you start to look at them, things are going to pop up. And, you know, it won't surprise me if there's some additional fees, but th this is a pretty good start. Certainly. So my one question is, is that, you know, um, we, we know there's a river running underneath the building. <laughs> yes. Right now there's probably a flood under oh. the building. And that, um, but... Is any type of what they're looking at here going to give us some sort of an idea of what we need from a foundational standpoint? So um, some of the grades will certainly help that. Some of the solutions to the floor itself would certainly prevent that um, if we go with a flowable fill in there so that we no longer have a crawl space. Mm -hmm. um, like I was explaining earlier today, I was talking to a resident um, about this facility. And, you know, if we're going to do things like that to make those corrective measures to keep the water out of the building, then we want to know what kinds of, you know, plumbing do we got to put in the floor. If we're going to move some bathrooms to the back, we're going to move the kitchen. Then, again, this conceptual, you know, would give us, that would give them the information they need to know to, to kind of hit, you know, tell us what we need for the long term for, the, for this building. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? What do you want to do? Proceed. 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 All I need is a consensus, Mr. Chairman. Sounds like you have one. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, we have an agenda item on pickleball. I know some of those folks are here so that they don't have to stay here until um, who knows how long it's going to take us to get through this agenda tonight. Let's see if we can bring some of that forward. Unless anyone has an objection. Mr. Chair, before we go forward, do we know how many opening seats we have to fill? Uh, it says we have two alternate positions and two full-time positions, Great. according to my agenda. Thank you. So I believe there are folks here to be interviewed this evening. I know I have a paper on it here. There's too many papers going. Do you have it right here? Okay. So I have, um, since I'll butcher their last names, I have Brian and Stephen. Come on up. And Mr. Chair, there was one other person that... <laughs> Wanted to recognize the Margo. Uh, one other person was Margo. Ah, yeah. yeah. Margo. So she had put in a. Yeah, y'all come up, can come on up if you like, yeah. and introduce yourselves. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Steve Spaziani. I'm at 12 Gary Drive. My wife Margo, also at 12 Gary Drive. And, good, um, good to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really, really nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Brian Smoker, Sammy, and I live at uh, Moulton Drive, 25 Moulton Drive. Fantastic. Um, you know, if you have, please have a seat. If one of you want to stay at the podium, we'll interview all three of you at the same time, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, we have no idea what to expect, so just have at it. Um, well, you're going to be completely in charge of building the courts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and well, funding. Yeah, and funding. And, and you got to go out and raise the money for it. No, just <laughs> <laughs> as we saw from the union leader this weekend, um, you know, pickleball has really taken off not only here in New Hampshire, but in the United States. So we have... Um, formed a task force so that we can uh, figure out how to appropriately go forward 
and, uh, and how to fund it and, and, and how to do that. So what we're looking for is volunteers like yourself to do that heavy lifting for us so that we can make a decision quickly. We want to try to do something for this budget season, and this budget season starts in the first weekend of November. So we're looking to put folks on the task force. We'll help you as much as we can, and hopefully you'll be able to give us an idea of what direction to go in based on imp number of people's input. So if that sounds like something good to you, and um, you know, we'll continue. It, it works for me. Yeah, I wouldn't have signed up. All right, well, I'll leave it to the counselors if they want to ask you any questions. Well, there's only three of us in four yeah. positions. <laughs> so. Well, there's people who are already appointed on the task force. There you go. So anything for these folks? I noticed, um, Stephen, you already uh, teach uh, pickleball as yeah, well, and you are already, already we you both, both teach, teach as well, uh, and Hampson Health and Fitness. you tour all over, and you play at all sorts of we different do. locations. We do. We were actually in a tournament this weekend up in Exeter, um, and we play. We are at a, getting our teaching and coaching certificate on next week. We have a clinic in Boston that we have to attend. After that, we'll be official certified coaches and trainers. Is there anything that you're seeing in the various towns um, that you see that would be uh, better suited on a pickleball court or an area that no, you see deficiencies in other areas that you'd like to be Absolutely. good here. Yeah, yeah, so we've actually we played, played in Litchfield, and that's where Brian and I played. Yeah. We met yeah. there, and we played against each other. Yeah. <laughs> but we, um, I mean, the first thing we talked about was these great new courts in Litchfield that were full right next to the two tennis courts, which stayed empty the entire time we were there. <laughs> and uh, the l a few things that were missing, like lights we talked about, and some this uh, uh, pickleball courts have a certain type of finish, a court surface, mm -hmm. and if you don't protect that finish from people dragging in sand or whatever, it's going to get ruined quick. So we talked about that too. Little things like a like a welcome mat or something stupid that would just let people brush up their feet. Something simple. Also, the way you face the court, you know, you don't want to face east and west because the sun's going to rise. <laughs> you know, you're using tennis on the sideline. So they're smart in Litchfield where they did it north and south. Right. They did a really nice job. Mm -hmm. They uh, set it up. What they didn't do in Litchfield, which is too bad, is there's not a community. I mean, one thing about Lawnagary and why I moved here from Wyndham many, many years ago is there's a sense of community here. You know, how we do the, the common concerts and the band supporting the line. If we were to build, hypothetically, a nice pickleball facility that had the um, portico that's in Derry, but has the size and layout of Litchfield, that's a win-win mm -hmm. right there. And the speed of Litchfield, we've talked a little bit about this. Yep. There's a gentleman named Peter Ames, and Peter Ames is in charge of the recreation department for Litchfield. And I did give him a call last week and spoke to him how much, how far, how long, how bad. Mm -hmm. And he's willing to share everything with us. Mm. Do so. Fantastic. Uh, Wonderful. Great news. You know, so, yeah, we, we bring, uh, he brings the skills, <coughs> I bring the connections. We both love the game. Uh, I, I bought a pickleball paddle for my granddaughter on Christmas. She showed up last week as a surprise for her birthday. She's from Florida. And all she wanted to do was play pickleball. Go, go figure. A grand she win too. Generation. Well, I beat her. Yep. I beat her. <laughs> 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 this year. Yeah. So by next year, you'll be losing. Okay. Yeah, well, the goal is to see her beat me. Yeah, but that's yeah. the community of this sport is so huge. It, it's not just competitive, and we are very competitive players, but it's fun. And if you lay it out right and you have some kind of a place where people can set up picnic tables, this could be a big deal. Yeah. And a lot of fun for our, our community. And that's kind of why I want to help you out. In yeah. the surrounding towns that you've also been to, how many, I guess, courts are there usually that you see? Okay, Nashua has um, eight. Nope, ten. Uh, four, lit, four lit. The Shady Lanes, those six are lit. They're fairly new. Greeley Park are converted tennis courts. They have four courts there that are lit. Um, Fields Grove are not lit, but they're resurfacing them right now. There's four courts there. Derry has two dedicated courts and one at, um, at AC Park, and then there's one at Hood. But that's a converted tennis court. It works okay, but the net's a little high. Anyway, um, what else is there? Manchester, there's eight, I'm sorry, Prout. 12 courts, at six Prout. at Prout and six at Rock Rimmon. Yeah. We play there. Hampstead is building a new facility. I don't know if you're aware of that. Ted Curtin owns the Salem Athletic Club as well as Hampstead Health and Fitness. He's building 603 Pickleball, which is 12 courts, six Ted indoor. Or outdoor. I'm sorry? Ted six indoor. Six or indoor, or six outdoor. Uh, we already teach for him. Um, and we are planning on teaching there at that facility. He's hoping to host um, big, big.
big professional, professional tournaments. tournaments. Mm -hmm. wow. And uh, this Six and Concord that we play up at the Steeplegate Mall, you might have seen it in the paper. Yep. Yep. And that's a guy named Peter that we play with, um, and he's running that right now. This yeah, this this four in Atkinson that are new and two are dedicated now. They just finished those a couple of weeks ago. That's great. Uh, and yeah. So in Salem has courts. I you know, there's a bunch around. Did I send you the plans to? Yes. Was it Groton or Little? Uh, I think it was li Little. Little I, th I thought so. Yeah, they were building six outdoor courts. Yeah, and I know the picnic table. There's a lot. Rye. I think that was going and all yeah, the towns all across the north are building them, too, from what I've seen. I'm sorry? All the towns across the north are building them as well. As yeah, they I've are. Seen. And if you look, if you drive by a tennis facility, there's going to be pickleball players on yeah. it. It's kind of sad. I grew up with tennis and racquetball, so it's different. Yeah. But so I'll accept a motion. <laughs> I will make a motion to approve um, all three. All three. All, well, all three, but we need to put two as yeah. full-time members. To, who wants to be the, uh, the alternate. alternate? The alternate. You'll be oh, the alternate. That's, that's a lot. Right. That was <laughs> <laughs> so I will make a motion to appoint Brian. Um, I will not butcher your name and Stephen Pizzani um, for you? the full-time positions <laughs> and. Um, Brian's wife, I forget your name. Steve's Margo. wife. Steven's wife, sorry. That's all right. Uh, what was your name? Margo. Margo for the alternate position that we have open. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Chair, what's affirmative? See the town clerk and be sworn in. Cool. Yay. Yeah. We'll get this um, thing rolling. I have one question. Sure. Yes. If we do get another alternate, are we allowed to bring that person forward to sure. talk to you about it? Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Um, next item, order 2023-06. Um, so, Brad, where are you? Um, licensing of junkyard uh, pursuant to RSA 236. So I have got um, Murray's Auto as well as, I believe I should have SNS Metals too, right? Yes. Sure. Murray's Auto, SNS Metals. Those are the only two left. Okay. If you want to speak to both of them, Brad, that'd be great. Very good. So we're going to cover 202306 and 202307. Brad Anderson, Assistant Billing Inspector for the Town of Londonderry. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Councilman. An inspection of the subject junkyard of Murray's Auto Recycling at 55 Hall Road on June 5th, 2023, determined compliance with license conditions on preparation for renewal. The applicant continues to work with DES to maintain compliance and the recommended best management practices. During my visit, it appeared that Mr. Dudek is following proper best management practices. On occasion, I would make unannounced visits and I would find the fencing would be down and cars occasionally would be stacked higher than they should be. The problems that he was having, what he told me, was the the thrasher, the shredder rather, uh, from Schnitzer, located in Everett, Massachusetts. The big machine would be breaking. So I asked him to get me a letterhead from Schnitzer with the dates when they were down, and he submitted that to me. Based on the recent inspection and other revisits, properly during the year, it appears the applicant is operating within the requirements of their license and renewal of the license is recommended. So let's hear about SNS metals and then I'll go to questions yeah. if that's okay. Yeah. For SNS recycling, an inspection on the junkyard was also conducted on June 5th determine compliance with the license conditions in preparation for renewal. The applicant continues to work with the DES to maintain compliance with the recommended best management procedures due to the nature of the junkyard. Operation is determined by DES. Mr. Salamini also operates as a metal recycling facility for the non-automatic automotive metals received in this site. No adverse work conditions were observed during the inspection that would prohibit the renewal of his license. Previous on unannounced visits to Mr. Salimi's, Salamini's junkyard, I would find the vehicles parked too close 
to the road and the aisleways blocked up where the fire trucks would be, have difficult time getting into it. I addressed them to Mr. Salomini and within days he had the issues fixed. Based on the recent inspection and other visits to the property during the year, it appears that the applicant is operating within the requirements of their license. Renewal of the license is recommended. Questions? Yes. Um, Brad, thank you for your presentation. Uh, a couple mm. questions. You mentioned some violations during the duration in between the last um, inspection with, or, or with your un, uh, unannounced inspections. Specifically, you mentioned uh, regarding the facility on Hall Road uh, vehicle, the issue with the fencing and the cars, and then the uh, SNS you mentioned, uh, vehicles too close to the road and fire lanes, stuff like that. Um, I did hear, I believe I heard you say regarding SNS metals that um, within a couple of days of you bringing the issue or addressing the issue, they uh, then again became compliant with the. Uh, the rules, laws, and regulations. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. And then you stated regarding the Hall Road location, uh, Murray's Auto uh, fencing the cars, which you had stated that there was, uh, you asked for uh, sh uh, Schnitzer. Is that correct? Yes, it's Schnitzer, schnitzer thrashing. I, I, I think they, they thrashed the cars. Yeah. They Did picked them up at the... They thrash them did, down in did Everett. You, um, did you see, did you notice that the dates that they stated that their machine was inoperable was in, concurrent with the dates that you noticed the, the violations of, of the rules? I did, and they, and they were very close. And at first, when he, they started the machine back up again, when they fixed that machine, yeah. the cars in Murray's junkyard remained piled higher than they should be. I went down and talked to Mr. Ed Dudek about that and to find out why. And he said, it's because everybody is backed up. So all the people that other people that bring the cars there as well are also backed up. So it's a slower process bringing the cars through. And eventually the cars did go down, yes. And it, as of right now, it's corrected? Yes. Okay. For both locations? Yes. Okay. So in the, um, and you recommend approval for both? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, I, just, I have a couple questions about Murray's. Yes, um, it's a non-conforming property, correct? I'm not, I'm not sure of that, sir. Meaning that it's in a I believe it's in a residential area and it has certain restrictions. Um, one of them is our auctions. Are auctions allowed to happen on that property? I do not know. Or okay, auctions. auctions. Auction. I don't know. Because I, I believe that they're not allowed, but they have been happening, is what I'm being told. So I didn't know if you checked into that at all. Uh, I have heard of auctions. Uh, I've had complaints of auctions happening on that property. I have investigated those complaints in the past. I have not heard that recently, but I've heard them in the past. I've gone to, in to, uh, to inspect that, and I've had no proof, no evidence. There was an advertisement in the London Dairy Times for an auction back in May. I it's just rare. No, I didn't know if you nope. if that was allowed or not. Um, our vehicles allowed to be parked overnight on the Murray's Auto site outside of the gate. The the employees' vehicles may be parked there. Okay. What about um, a box truck that was parked there from May middle of May until almost end of June? Middle of May, the box truck. It was a big box there was truck. A it, was fire truck it was there about there. a month. There was a fire truck that was there. This is just in the past since May. Okay. Um, I don't I, recall I, a fire truck that. being there. Since um, and then just to add on to that, right now there's a, a vehicle parked right now today um, outside the thing. I just not know if that's allowed. I just want to know if that's allowed the, or not. The owner's vehicles. It's not. You know, I don't think it's an owner's vehicle, but I just was curious. How would it. anybody know whether it's the owner's vehicle or not? Just asking. I, I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know how anybody would know if it's the owner's vehicle or not. Ron, is this something you're witnessing? Yeah. I actually drove by. I had, I had a resident contact me about some of these issues. And so I you drove went by down there and found the box truck? I actually have a picture of the box truck. So was and, this um, reported to the building department yeah. that it was there? I believe it was reported. I can confirm that later, but I, I just didn't know. I just I was trying to get information I, as to whether I've or not. I've never heard anything about is, a box truck. It is truck or not. Yet. That's all. All right, so. 
I'm just trying to get information on whether or not it is or not. I understand, but if the, but if the violations are not reported, yeah. you know, they there's there's no evidence of it if they're not reported. I mean, it's you know, if if they're violations and they're reported, he should have a log of those violations. What would be the proper way for a resident to report that to you? The, they can call the building department. Okay. They can, uh, and yeah, you can actually, you can access my extension 108. Okay. Leave a message. You can send me an email. My email is on the website. Okay. Yep. Come in, you can come into the department. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> As well, you could also fill out a formal complaint. Um, there used to be a, a thing you could do online. Is that going to come back at any time soon where you could fill out a form online and it would be mm -hmm. recorded? I don't know. Okay. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? No public comment. There is. I walked. No, there is no public comment. Public comment is closed. Sir, if you do it again, I'm going to ask you to leave. Um, I, you've been told multiple times. The law. I don't, sir, as long as I'm sitting here running this meeting, those are the rules. If you don't like it, you can leave. You can't break state law. Sir, you can leave if you're going to continue to disturb this meeting. John, there is an RSA that he, that he did bring to my attention. I don't know if that impacts. I'm just citing the fact. We are not it. taking public comment. Okay. You, you, you want to, you can leave, sir. Do you know that there was a court that you filed with the courts? Sir. Are you aware of that? Sir, you can leave, sir. No, you're, you're, what you're doing, John, is you're not doing your job. But, was the, in the sir, you're, you're out of order. Court, sir, you're out of order. Sir, you're out of order. No, John, you can't do your job. Sir, you're out of order. Please leave. Is that a problem, lady? No, we can't. No. Because if this goes worse, you're, I'm going to sue the town. Because you're breaking RSA again and ignoring court orders where you filed with the court. I, thank you. Good night. you got a real problem, John. And they've been unlicensed for 10 days. Good night. Mr. Chairman, can I just inquire uh, of Councillor Dunn what that RSA is? Uh, yeah. Governing the... Yeah, you sent that to me. <coughs> so, what do you guys want to do? You have two two um, orders out. Make a motion that we pass them. Well, I so just want to chair, put eyes on this uh, okay, uh, first I, to make sure that we're not. I withtract that motion until Johnny. the town manager gets what he Come needs. May, Mr. Chairman, if, if I can. Just take a look at that. Yeah. This is what he sent to me earlier. And who sent it to you, John? Um, Richard Walensky. Oh, Richard Walensky. Sent it to me earlier. Okay. I just don't want us to be in trouble for something that we didn't do. Yeah, 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 yeah. I trust you. Do you want to pen this and move on to your agenda, Mr. Chair? Um, he's looking at something. We'll have to pay attention if we move on. Fair enough.
Aaron, we'll go into recess for five minutes.
Boston. Okay, we are now back in session. Can you go over and put the horse in? Okay. All you have to do is just go. And can you move it all in place? Unfortunately. John. Thank you. All right. I got a call. Can, can you put the yeah, horse back in the good. barn now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, sorry about that, Johnny. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> due to the multiple disruptions that have been happening during our meetings and everything, when people are doing those, they're asked to leave. And, it, it, and it's a sad state of the fact that that's what has to happen sometimes when people don't want to, you know, follow the, the rules that are in place. With regards to the license, if there's anyone else who is in the room who would like to speak to either one of these licenses, we will entertain their comment. Mm -hmm. If there's not, we're going to move forward. Seeing no comments, how would you like to proceed? I will motion to approve both licenses as the town inspector has now found a default to move forward. Uh, I'll second I'll it. do it formally. Oh. So, uh, Ms. Chair, I'd like to approve order number 2023-06 and uh, order number 2023-07. Uh, a motion. I need a second. Second. Did you want to say something? I just want to know if there was a way we could get clarification on those couple issues before we move forward. Like, are there, are there vehicles allowed to be parked outside there, or are they not? And is he allowed to have an auction? Because they definitely had so, an auction. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, because I, I, I can speak to those. Yeah, please, because I, I definitely know that so, there was an added lender at times for an uh, auction. Yes. So uh, there's a letter dated November 23rd, 2021, addressed to in a butter, uh, that I spent a significant amount of time researching this. Uh, this was before I was the town manager. Um, I think it would be of interest to the council and to anybody who is interested in this um, uh, exchange that's just occurred. Uh, but what I can tell you is this, it, it addresses most of these issues. Um, it addresses the, uh, the vehicle issue um, that you raised, Councillor Dunn. Um, vehicles uh, are not permitted um, to be parked um, outside in general. Um, and if I can just read, because I don't yeah. have this fresh in my memory, but I, it's pertinent to your, your question. Um, as we discussed, uh, it, on this particular occasion, a code enforcement officer was not able to substantiate the fire truck being there when he visited the, uh, the property, and it appears it has been removed. A court in, uh, code enforcement officer then spoke to Murray about uh, Murray's about the fire truck. You also provided a picture of a van and a flat, flatbed truck parked in the lot. The van was there uh continuously for a period of time i have driven driven by the property twice during the day and did not make uh those observations however i do not doubt that uh what what your what this resident was telling me was correct um as we discussed documenting violations is challenging because uh oftentimes this would be overnight when the code enforcement officer isn't necessarily working um we sent a letter uh, at this time reminding mr dudek of his obligations under the applicable court order um, and I asked in the future uh, that the resident uh, report these violations directly to the code enforcement officer in real time, which will help us address uh, and enforce this, this provision. Um, the, as far as the barn being grandfathered is concerned, this is a bit of a complex uh, legal analysis, but um, basically uh, the a barn, there was a, as you pointed out, a junkyard operation that was taking place there going back quite, quite a ways. Um, and that was documented in um, litigation between the town and Mr. Dudek. Um, that operation that was taking place out in the open was at, at a certain point in time moved in, indoors into um, a, a barn. Um, there was, uh, there was uh, some consideration given um, at the ZBA to whether this constituted an expansion of a non-conforming use or a grandfathering, um, I think, as you, as you pointed out. Um, and that was uh, discussed by the ZBA. There was legal advice that was given um, from town council. And it was determined that um, even if there had been a non-expansion, um, it was slight and it was um, sort of in natural and in keeping with the existing use of the structure um, and therefore permissible. Um, it was. And, and what I wrote um, on that point in my letter of November uh, of 21 uh, was, instead of outdoor open air junkyard operations, those same operations, in other words, the same use, were moved indoors to an improved 
uh, and more efficient or different instrumentality. That's the language that the cases use to talk about this natural, um, the, you know, slight expansion. Um, however, the use of the property is the same. Um, that is uh, a natural expansion um, and was uh, regarded by the environmental regulators as preferable to conducting those operations um, out, outside. Um, as far as, um, I think the other issue that you raised was the... Um, the auctions. The auctions. Auctions are not permitted here. Um, okay. If, uh, uh, to my knowledge, that's my, my best memory. I don't think I addressed it in this, um, in this letter, uh, but auctions are not permitted here. Um, if somebody has evidence that an auction is taking place, I, I encourage them to report that to the code enforcement office in the same fashion, um, and that will be looked into. Um, I can also uh, point out uh, to address the council's concerns that um, you know Mr. Mr. Dudek is getting a free ride here. Um, I would like to just uh, like the chairman's indulgence to just read from a letter of December 29th um, that was delivered on behalf of the town to Mr. Dudek. Mr. Dudak, the town has received satisfactory evidence that on December 7th, 2021, the above referenced property was in violation of RSA 236-123, which requires a junkyard to be, quote, substantially screened, close quote. A copy of a photograph documenting the violation is enclosed with this letter. I am aware this violation has recurred uh, periodically over the years. I am also aware that in 2015, the town wrote to you noting the same issue. Uh, stating, quote, the town council is aware that this is not the first time uh, that your junkyard has failed to comply. Um, I continued um, to talk about uh, what the penalties were for um, uh, noncompliance with this statute. Um, this shall constitute a written notice of the violation. Please be advised that a daily civil penalty of $275 for the first offense and $500, $550 for a subsequent offense will begin to accrue until this vi violation is rectified should the town commence an enforcement action. Uh, I reminded uh, Mr. Dudek that the burden of complying with the terms of your license, state law, and the court orders entered against you is on you. It is not the town's obligation to remind you of this obligation to comply. Accordingly, please be advised that with respect to re recurring issues in the future, it is the town's intention to address these issues this way. One, there will be no further 30-day notices with opportunity to cure the violation. Two, the town will commence enforcement action. And three, all future violations will be tracked and presented to the town council. Um, additionally, the town has received nu numerous complaints about a vehicle being left out front without a front plate um, overnight. While the town has not at this time substantiated this complaint, you were advised that the front lot is not to be used for storage. I, I say all of that um, just to amplify the, the point that I just made, which is that there are no free rides here. Uh, the town takes this seriously. I have sp this is my file yeah. on uh, Hall Road. I, know. Um, I have spent uh, dozens of hours on the phone with a local uh, concerned resident. Um, and. Uh, I think that uh, it sounds like, based on the visits that uh, our code enforcement officer has made, that message has, has been received uh, by the applicant. But all of that is, is what has happened in the past, and uh, I hope that addresses uh, the concerns. It does. The only thing that I can address with my own eyes today is that there was an auction that took place on May 28th at 8.15 a.m. It was a 2028 Subaru. So if you know if this auction took place online? I don't know, sir. I just have the picture of the ad. That's all I know. So I just didn't yeah, know. We, so we don't know if it took place there. We don't know that it took place online. No. Nobody was there to witness that the auction took place. I just know that he, he put an ad in the paper for it. So We, we can certainly look into that, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the other thing I would note about the, uh, the, the gentleman from the public raising, um, asking the council if the council is aware that something was filed with a court, but the court doesn't have it. Um, something I'm, I'm here to tell you something was filed with the court uh, so in terms of an enforcement document. Um, and I'm also here to tell you that the court doesn't have it. Uh, it again, I was a prosecutor for four years. Um, uh, the court mis misplaces uh, things that are filed. Uh, that, that happens. Um, and so uh, I can personally attest to the fact that something was filed with the court um, seeking enforcement action. Uh, again, speaking to how, how seriously the town takes this, the court, the, the court lost it. Um, Nobody is, uh, nobody is lying, uh, nobody is corrupt. Um, that's just what happened. Um, and so all of that is to say that uh, Mr. Dudek uh, has, has taken these uh, concerns to heart. It's the council's decision whether to license him or not license him. Um, but I can tell you that the town staff is not shrugging this off um, and takes this uh, just as seriously as, as uh, the residents do. And in addition to that, there is a court order that's been pl in place almost six years that makes Mr. Dudak comply to every piece of his license and everything. And in accordance with the court order, if he violates it, the court can make the decision to pull his license. 
we have spent tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees to make sure that Mr. Dudak complies with his license. Tens of thousands of dollars. So anyone who's saying that we're corrupt, taking money on his side, is speaking with forked tongue. I want to say that to me. I just, I just got those. I just got those couple of pieces of information. That's all I had. I don't have anything about anything else. Um, the the point I would emphasize is timely uh, no, notification to the code enforcement department is the only way that these issues can be addressed. Okay. I have a motion on the floor and a second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Chair votes affirmative. License passes. Okay. Uh, next item. All right. So, Justin, if we can take both of these, uh, 20, 2023 and 202308 and 202309. I think there should be a third one as well. Uh, uh, 202312. Yep. 202312. Yeah, we can take, we'll take all three of them at once. Perfect. So 202308 is a withdrawal from the Recreation Capital Reserve Fund. We are requesting 5,000 out of the fund to help assist purchase a diesel mower. We put this out to bid back in May. We received four bids. We're going with um, a diesel mower from, I believe it's Turf Pro. And the remaining will come from the Recreation's operating budget. Any, um, go ahead and do all three, then I'll do questions. Perfect. Um, the next one is a withdrawal from the capital reserve for the cable equipment. This is the school district's annual request. You'll see a list of the expenses that they'll be uh, utilizing this on. Uh, per our P public access agreement with Comcast, we received $32,500. 8000 of that is earmarked for the school district to upkeep their public access. And the last one is unanticipated revenue for fiscal year 23. This is for the rabies clinic. Uh, boat equipment donated $500 to the police department. And the last one is health trust wellness. They give us, they give the town uh, police, fire, and town hall $500 for maintaining healthy items throughout the town and helping with the health and mental wellness of the town, fire, and police. Any questions on any one of these three orders? Yes. Seeing none, I'll accept the motion to approve 08, 09, and 12. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve ordinance number 202308, 09, and 12. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair, what's affirmative? I am, we're on to order. Um, Thank you, Justin. 202310. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. John Trotter, Director of Engineering and Environmental Services for the Town of Londonderry. I'm here this evening to request the uh, withdrawal from the Roadway Maintenance Trust Fund in the amount of $557,000 uh, for repairs and improvements to various town roads in the, in the Town of Londonderry for our shimmin overlays and some of the, the reconstruction of a number of, uh, of roadways here in town. Any questions? Yes, Mr. Chair. Please proceed. Uh, which roads are you going to be looking to be doing? The, this year, Ted, what we have on the list, uh, portions of, uh, excuse me, South Road from Gilcrest to Kendall Pond Road, uh, portions of Harvey Road, uh, high range, portions of high range, uh, Shasta from Mammoth to high range. Uh, we we re reconstructed Sunrise this past spring. Uh, we have Otterson, portions of Otterson, uh, some port roads within the Kings, uh, Hillside Ave from the town line to Londonderry Road, uh, Webster Road and Parmenter Road from 102 to Boyd Road. So again, each of them, they all come in different costs. Some of them have curbing, some of them have structures that need to be raised, so it's it's a hard hard thing to say. It's you know, ten dollars per linear foot for each of these roads. And it's impressive what you're able to do with such little money, um, I, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know this is not purview to this order, but may I ask um, when he may be getting to 
other roads. Bancroft Road? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, he doesn't live on that street anymore, so now he can ask about it. Oh, you don't? <laughs> no. Oh, the, no, I, I don't, I'm just kidding. <laughs> or will that be, or will work, would that be in conjunction with the new sewer pipe? Um, no, again, the sewer pipe will be on a northerly port, or excuse me, the easterly portion of that, so that the, the sewer goes, uh, comes out of the, the power lines, yes. head, heads east, heads westerly down the road, and then it's goes cross country. Okay. The problem with Bancroft Road is again, it's full depth reconstruction of that roadway. So again, I've, with the limited funds, I gotta keep the ro good roads good and wait till I get the money to another million dollars to, to be able to, to do that portion of Bancroft Road. Yes, it's I'm just concerned as it's a high traffic road that you know it's just seeming to get worse and worse. So totally understand. Hopefully in the future it might be looked at for um, Reconstruction at some point. It, it it is on the list again. It's just it's like the Harvey our, Road. Our hundred two hundred year list. Yeah, it's all, like the Harvey Road culvert when you only get six hundred thousand dollars a year and it's one point five million to repair it, mm -hmm. and then maintaining the other one hundred ninety one miles of road. It's a juggling act. Good. The good news well, is, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, Councillor comes that uh, as Representative McDonald uh, pointed out, we got another one-time uh, in infusion of uh, highway uh, funds uh, from the state this year. So uh, the first one of almost a million dollars that we got last year wasn't wasn't a one-time thing. Hopefully, there's an emerging understanding at the state level that uh, we really need some help, um, and I think our representatives understand that. I spoke to Senator Carson about it as well. Um, so those those dollars really do matter when it comes to um, some of these projects. Wonderful, thank you. Real quick, Mr. Chair, can we direct the uh, town manager that just to have these towns that uh, Mr. Trotty was talking about reflected in the minutes, please? You mean towns? the roads? Roads. The roads. I'm roads. sorry. The roads that are being repaired with the five hundred and fifty-seven thousand, maybe in the recorded. Yeah, the I minutes. think we actually have the roads on the website that, that are being done, right? Correct. So if we could, you know, there were already some. We just didn't get a list in our minutes. Yeah, they just, you know, if they can just make sure that oh. she adds them to the minutes. But I will. Yeah, they're Thank published you. on the website already. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to adopt order number 2023 10. Second. Those in favor, so by saying aye. 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 Sure, that's affirmative. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, order 2023-11, order relative to distribution of oh, fire department capital reserve funds. Chief Holloway. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Chair the oh. members of the council. Um, <clears throat> before you this evening, uh, for request for uh, $41,647.19 for approximately 10 sets of firefighting gear. Um, I think you'll recall uh, I've been in front of you a couple of times now. The fire department's operating budget uh, includes a safety line of approximately $20,000, which uh, historically, um, many years ago, was enough to purchase 10 sets of structural firefighting gear uh, per year. Um, but uh, due to uh, rising costs of other safety-related items, such as the repair and maintenance of fire gear, uh, testing of ladders, pumps, uh, and a number of other things, uh, the money just doesn't uh, uh, suffice any longer. Um, you know, just to give you an idea, uh, we have approximately 60 uh, firefighters, 60 um, operating on the fire ground or could be in an, a, a, a fire ground. Um, they each get two sets of firefighting gear. So uh, we've got about 120 sets of gear to the tune of just about uh, just under $300,000 worth of uh, firefighting ensembles uh, that we maintain. Um, so when you put it in that perspective, the 41000 that we're um, requesting uh, this year um, doesn't sound as bad. Uh, but over the last three years, um, I've been before you for 56, 36, and uh, now 41. Um, we're kind of diversifying our gear acquisition a little bit. Um, historically, we've always gone with a, an organization called Globe, which uh, manufactures up in Pittsfield, New Hampshire. But um, after the pandemic, uh, there's been some... Um, supply and demand issues and we found ourselves uh, waiting a year plus to, to purchase firefighting gear. Um, another company which is out of Ohio called uh, Firedex um, has uh, been a rising star 
and um, we've done some wear trials with their gear and we've, uh, we've been pretty satisfied with them. So I think uh, from a, an asset management standpoint, diversification is good because uh, it doesn't pigeonhole us to just one set of, of structural gear. Um, the, the company Firedex is able to produce gear for us in about six to 10 weeks right now. Um, and the quality is just as good, if not better, uh, than the stuff that we get from Globe. But, um, you know, out of uh, an interest in diversification, we're also continuing to purchase sets of, of gear from, from Globe as well. So we're doing five this year from Firedex and five from Globe. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I'll accept the motion to approve um, order number 11. So Make a motion. So moved. Second. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Everybody's affirmative. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Bruce. Okay. Um, item number 10 on new business. Assessing Department 2023 Revaluation Project Analysis and Preliminary Report. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Council. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to be as brief as I possibly can. Yeah, uh, my name is Steve Hamilton. Hi, Steve. I am the assessor for the town. Um, my company is Whitney Consulting Group. I have a contract with the town. With me this evening is Adrian Summers. Adrian is the assistant assessor for the town, a town employee. We work together on a lot of projects uh, very closely. Our, our teams, the town employees and the Whitney Consulting Group employees, are interchangeable as team members in the assessing role and function. But I wanted to bring Adrienne here tonight, especially to introduce you, you to her and her to you um, as she is um, the head employee within the assessing function here um, in London Dairy. Thank Qu you. Quickly. Um, right back. Every, mm -hmm. every town has to do a revaluation at least every five years. Mm -hmm. The last time that we did a revaluation here in London Dairy was 2021. Uh, the uh, town Council has determined that it's appropriate to do these revaluations every two years. And so uh, this is the next natural point at which we would want to examine the assessment performance and, uh, and show you what will be uh, anticipated for the revaluation this year in 2023. Uh, we need to be able to bring market uh, properties to market value and in the assessing world that means attaining a ratio uh, an assessment to sales ratio of between 90 and 110 percent of market value and so that's the range uh, that equals market value uh, as we did in the last revaluation we we try to try to target um, a ratio um, we in the last uh, last evaluation, we we had scoped out a target of between 90 and 95 percent of market value to try and be within that range uh, to keep us within the 90 to 110 percent range, but uh, to leave some room for um, any error to be below uh, the 100 percent of market value. DRA, the Department of Revenue Administration in the state, they conduct an overall median uh, ratio study annually. Uh, the last time that they completed that was for April 1st of 2022. Uh, the ratio, that relationship between assessments and market value had dropped to 77.3 um, over the two year period since the last uh, revaluation. And so as of April 1st, 2022, the sale prices were approximately 29% higher than the current uh, um, than assessments. Um, when we're looking at the sales that are, have occurred most recently, um, they're about in that range um, at about 76% uh, now. Um, we think that um, a townwide reassessment um, is an important thing to undertake at this time in order to keep those market values current. And like I said, we're going to be targeting uh, between 90 and 95 percent of market value um, in order to hit uh, within that range of 90 to 110 percent uh, while staying well away from the 110 end of that range. Um, the, some good news is that uh, we have a good uh, distribution of uh, changes in 
uh, market value. Uh, the preliminary analysis that we've completed of 506 qualified sales um, in the year preceding uh, April 1st of 2023 um, shows that all property is at 76 percent, as I mentioned. Single family homes are at 76 percent. Condominiums are at 77 percent. Manufactured housing units or mobile home units are at 64 percent. Uh, they have been the most impacted by the shortage of affordable housing units within uh, not only Londonderry but the greater state. Um, they have seen uh, very significant increases in the value of those units. Um, and importantly, commercial property um, is showing to, to be in the same range. I'm not sure that 68 percent is going to be the final tally. Uh, we still have work to do to understand some of the sales that occurred. Commercial property sales can often include a lot of manufacturing equipment and other things that we can't tax as real estate. And so the final result may be different than our preliminary analysis. But um, overall, uh, the coefficient of dispersion, which is the measurement, uh, if you were looking at a, uh, an archery target, uh, it would be the rings from the center of the target. Uh, we want to see those be greater than five. You don't want them too tightly dis, um, distributed because that would indicate maybe um, that we were cheating in some way, um, and less than 20. So at 11 already, uh, based on the model that we put in place in 2021, it's still performing pretty well. What that means is that there'll be less... Um, modulation between the different classes of property um, in the changes in value. It will be much more uniform this time than it had been in 2021. In 2021, there was a lot of uh, changeable uh, percentages of value. Everybody's individual assessment is going to be adjusted to account for the changes in real estate um, value for their property. Um, and when we complete that, an important part of it is what happens to uh, elderly and disabled uh, property values because uh, we need to make sure that the amount of exemptions that are granted um, helps to stay up to date with market value. And so we'll be completing a full analysis of what will happen uh, to the impact of elderly and disability tax exemptions that are granted. Um, our goal is always to try and make sure there's the same bang for the buck for uh, the people who receive uh, the exemptions on property. Everybody's situation is a little bit different, but we try to make sure that overall there's a, a similar um, effect on people's um, tax bill. We're going to present, present you, um, at the time that our analysis is, is complete, a full uh, analysis and projection of what those changes should be. Before one we thing send them out to the residents. Before we send them out to the residents. So in other words, we're going to reevaluate people. You're going to come and give us an analysis of what it might look like before we notify the residents what the reevaluation is. We can give you every single... We can give you a report of every single value in the community before Just so we send it I don't it want out. people to be surprised by, like, they get their, they get their bill and they go, I went up $50,000. Um, and we, I do understand that we understand that the tax rate will go down a certain amount as well. Right. But I just want to make sure we're as absolutely explaining it the best we possibly can before we send the bill out. We have a great process for that. And you may remember from uh, the last revaluation in 2021, we send out a notice to every single taxpayer um, during the summer. We invite them to come in and talk to us at what we call an informal hearing. It's a process by which they can talk to me or one of the other uh, appraisers who valued the property and get a full understanding of, of how we came up with their, uh, their assessment. Um, and we make those values available on our website for everybody in the town to look at not only what their assessment is, but what their neighbor's assessments are. So everybody has a good uh, level of understanding. So we'll, we'll be doing that entire process again uh, this year. Um, and it includes, um, it includes making that uh, communication here to the council. 
um, of what the individual results are. Uh, we can provide you each with um, either printed or an electronic form, uh, whatever is your preference. I did want to talk a little bit about, uh, because there has been um, question at a couple of meetings about uh, the amount of exemption that is granted to the 80 plus category um, of age. And the, the question was raised as to um, what, what would happen if the town, uh, like the town of Wyndham, uh, determined that once you reach the age of 80, uh, then the exemption would be the full value of your uh, property. Um, I've done some um, preliminary analysis of what the impact of that might have been in 2021. We don't have values right now, so it's, it's impossible for us to uh, determine what it would be in 2023. But if we look back to 2021 and what the, um, what the category ranges were in 2021, uh, there were a total of 79 people in that age category um, in 2021. 30 people in that category paid no taxes at all because the value of their home was less than the exemption amount. And so, um, you know, 38% of that 79-person uh, population, they didn't pay taxes at all. Um, the 49 people that were in that category that did pay taxes, if uh, they had the rest of their value exempted, uh, that would have been a total of $5,345,500 of exemption. That's additional exemption that would have been granted um, under, the, uh, under the theory that every, every piece of the value would be exempted. So that would be about 3.8% of our total revenue. Uh, not, not re that would be value. And so that would convert into about $98,000 in revenue based on the tax in revenue. rate. Okay, I, I misunderstood you. I yep. thought you were saying $5 million. Yeah, okay. Yep. You, you, you got it. Okay. Um, so that's that would be 000. about okay. uh, 1 1.9 cents on the, on the tax rate. That would be about the impact. Okay. Would have been in 2021. Gotcha. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, and so that's... Can um, you... Um, is there any way to look at an analysis that based on the number of uh, 55 and older as we now have in the community, what a projection like that may look like out into the future, now that we have about 900 homes that are 55 and older? Mm. I mean, I, I know that I'm not asking you to do it tonight, and I'm not yeah. asking you to do it for this year, but I'm just asking you to think about it. I, 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 think, I think about that it. alters our decision. Yeah, and, and uh, Mr. Chair, I think about it all the time because um, we, have, we have two things, two conflicting um, concepts uh, when people get to uh, the age of retirement. Um, one is, you know, it's a, it's a great time to relax and enjoy life, and the other is at some point they start to think, um, I want to make this, I want to make some financially responsible decisions for my future, and they start to uh, plan their estate in ways that changes the way that they might be able to interact with this kind of an ownership um, based exemption program. So one way that uh, people uh, look forward to limiting the exposure to um, the expense of maybe a nursing home at some point in the future is to place property into irrevocable uh, real estate trust, and which is a great vehicle to protect it in that way, but it also distances themselves from the ownership of the property, which generally unless they've carefully planned for it, um, is going to eliminate them from being able to get an exemption uh, because of the ownership Understood. Uh, situation. So, um, and we, we also want to make sure we have, we have a great set of uh, people who um, regularly uh, apply for and are requalified for these exemptions that they get. Uh, but um, we also don't want to make sure that we have too big a pile of uh, candy sitting out there uh, for people that, that may not be um, in, in the future as scru scrupulous about reporting their income and assets as they are right now. So we don't want to create a, you know, a negative 
an incentive for a negative uh, reaction. Um, and that would, of course, really kick up the cost of, uh, of that kind of a program. Um, so that's, um, in a nutshell, what we think would have happened in 2021. It gives you some sense of it. And when we get um, to the point where we have values completed and we pr provide the uh, um, evaluation of what we think uh, reasonable adjustments would be, we'll also include that calculation of what a full exemption at age 80 would be. Thank you. Any questions? So we'll look forward to you coming back and giving us the uh, same um, um, advanced look that the, the taxpayers are going to get to understand you know, what might be forthcoming in the December bill. I look forward to it. <laughs> Mr. Chair. But was there... <laughs> only only a tax assessor could say it looks full. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, honestly say that. <laughs> so are we going to have him come back November or October? Well, when he's when he's ready. Okay. Yeah. I guess he's well he's got to be ready before budget. I understand. Yeah. I understand. So I guess the better question is for him is do you have an idea when you'll be ready? Well, we anticipate that we'll be ready to send out the informal notices to taxpayers within a 3 or 4 week uh, time frame. So from we're now, gonna, yeah. Oh well. So we're going to be um, so that people understand because everyone will start to talk about that. Like, well, what if the market dips? That's why we're looking at it again in two years. Right. So that we're not doing it over a five-year period anymore. We're doing it to be more stabilizing, stabilizing with the economy and with the market. Correct. Okay. And based on the preliminary analysis that we've done, uh, the market um, is. The, the rate of increase is moderating. So, um, and that's, that's a good thing. And it, it may even bring a plateau along with it. But for uh, the, the last few months, since April 1st, mm -hmm. uh, things have been relatively very flat. So, and that's, that's a healthy thing for the real estate market and for people who are hoping to break into it especially. And just to confirm, this is residential properties only? No, this is all property. All property. I know. Yeah, so when you, com when you complete it, if you, we usually have some sort of an idea of whether we're 60-40 or 45-55 with commercial being 45 and residential being 55. If you can give us some sort of an idea of where we're at, that would be great, too. We can give you a summary of by category of, of all of the values. That would be great. Mm -hmm. All right. And you all understand that commercial properties don't fluctuate the same way residential properties yep. fluctuate. Okay. Everybody understands that. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next item, number 11, resolution 2023-14, uh, relative to establishing lender a community response team program. Mr. Chairman, very simple. Uh, we have a, uh, an alert uh, team. Um, those team members get deployed uh, periodically. Mr. Sipek came to me and said, hey, uh, we really should uh, formalize this to make sure that uh, there isn't any question uh, that if something were to happen to one of our alert volunteers, they would be covered under our insurance. That's the uh, purpose of the resolution that you have in front of you. Um, uh, I'm happy to take, and I'm sure Mr. Sipek is happy to take any questions that the council has. Any questions? I'll accept a motion to approve 20, where is it? 20. 2023-14. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes affirmative. Thank you to the alert team for everything you yes, did. Very much so. And I should uh, note Mr. Fortin is here as well, uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, discussion on proposed conservation easement map lot, map 17, lot 10. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm joined by Marge uh, Bedoy, the chair uh, of the Conservation Commission on this as well. Um, and again, this is something that I've spoken uh, with Mr. Speltz about. This is something that uh, the planning department has provided uh, some assistance on, um, and it is this. Uh, and I would invite, uh, at the chair's discretion, Ms. Bedoy to jump in if I should get any of this uh, wrong. The, we, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about development in the north part of town. Um, and one of the uh, remaining undeveloped areas is uh, about 22 acres uh, that's known as Map 17, Lot 10. 
Um, the this is part of uh, the Merrill uh, Farm area, although it is uh, mostly forested, um, and there is some wet uh, to to the right side of the property as it's configured in front of you. Um, the uh, Conservation Commission uh, has voted to recommend that the council enter into an agreement to purchase a conservation easement on this parcel of land. Um, that is what is on offer. Uh, and I will uh, quickly summarize, uh, probably with less uh, accuracy than Mr. Speltz could do if he were here himself, but he's, um, I believe, out of state, uh, some of the attractive features of this uh, proposal. Um, you can see that, uh, just taking another second on this slide, um, the parcel is outlined in blue. Um, this is the, the topo. Um, you can see that there's some pretty steep slopes, uh, but as you get to the, the right side of the property, I'm not sure where the uh, north-south is, um, that it does become a little bit wet. Um, the, uh, you can see the, the, the labeled uh, at the bottom right uh, of the screen there is the existing Merrill Conservation Easement. Part of the uh, Merrill property, as the council knows, is already in conservation. Um, and that parcel uh, contains the, I'm sorry, uh, it, you can see the, um, the Merrill's home, I believe, reflected uh, to the, in the top right of that parcel. Um, the, you can see the, um, the it's mostly forested, um, uh, entirely forested, and the um, picture here is taken before uh, leaf break in the spring. Uh, the northwest portion of the property, which is um, circled, is this is of prime importance, I think, to the Conservation Commission and their decision to make, make the recommendation that they made, um, the headwaters of the Little Coas tributary. Um, there's also some historical um, features uh, associated with this property, um, it being the route of the original Mammoth Road. Doesn't this property abut that um, that property that was coming in talking about putting apartments up there yes, up against because this property is also known as Merrill Hill isn't it yes I, I believe that's exactly oh, yeah, right yes it, yeah. it, it definitely abuts um, and I think that uh, you know I'm not wanting to speak for the Conscom but I think that one of the uh, reason you know there's a there is a concern about the pace and the scope of development in this area of town um, and this is a parcel that uh, could be developed as I as I will discuss a little bit more uh, I'm guessing are, are, who, who's involved in the active negotiations uh, uh, on the in terms of with with uh, the who's who, the landowner? who from the town is speaking to the Merrills yeah um, I, I don't know the answer to that not not me at the moment I don't know. All right, so I think we need um, some insight into what's going on with that I, I'm happy to uh, be, be we don't need to do it here but we yes need, we need to Cer certainly miss mr. chairman um, the uh, the, you, and this, this slide um, speaks a little bit to um, continuity and connectivity. Um, so you can see other town <laughs> conservation holdings um, highlighted uh, in blue, I'm sorry, in, in purple and in green. Um, it provides a wildlife corridor um, and it actually provides an undeveloped, is part of an undeveloped corridor extending all the way uh, to I-93 at the extreme right uh, top of this um, slide. Uh, it is comprised of both uh, Tier 1 and Tier 3 habitat. Um, the uh, Tier 1 habitat uh, highlighted on the left side is uh, among the best in the state. Uh, that's how it is characterized. The remainder is supporting habitat um, because it buffers the uh, Tier 1 habitat. Um, you can see the wildlife corridor um, information here. Um, the, whoops. Trying to keep it under 10 minutes. Um, the uh, Merrill, so this property, if it were developed, would break uh, the, the wildlife corridors here and, um, and do some uh, damage from that standpoint. Okay. Uh, here is uh, the high point of the property. This is actually some of the highest, um, to, to your point, Councillor Butler, some of the highest uh, land in Londonderry. Um, it is rocky uh, and, and steep, um, and that is going to limit the um, developability as I'll, as I'll mention in a second. 
Um, this is the original Mammoth Road, uh, a pretty cool look at just how wide this old road was. Um, and uh, Mr. Speltz has told me that that is uh, the basis of the nickname uh, Mammoth. Um, I guess there was a feeling that this road was um, uh, too, too wide uh, or it wasn't needed to, it didn't need to be that wide. Um, so if, if that's true, that's a pretty neat, uh, hmm. a neat historical note. Um, this is looking south back towards the Merrill Farm. Um, this marks the boundary, the stone wall does, of the existing easement and the property that we're talking about. Um, and this is, uh, this is the area where if there were to be development, um, we think most of that development would be taking place based on it being fairly flat and dry. Collateral benefits, um, pr that historical uh, preservation feature that I mentioned, uh, reducing traffic congestion in an area of town that, as you've heard tonight, is already experiencing traffic congestion, um, and affording uh, the public access to this site. You can see here um, that uh, this, the steep slopes are called out, um, and the soil limitations uh, right on Mammoth are, uh, are circled there as well. Um, based on a development review that took place um, involving uh, the planning department, uh, this parcel could support approximately three to four single-family uh, homes. Um, again, the keys, uh, the key limits on development are the steep slopes, uh, the wet areas, and um, it should be noted that this parcel is eligible for multifamily uh, residential, um, but only an engineering analysis could determine whether such a use um, could overcome the steepness um, and other limitations that I've mentioned. Um, the uh, next steps are uh, as follows. Um, the property uh, was appraised in 2011 for $219,000. Um, the uh, proposed or the terms that, that have been discussed by the by the Conservation Commission um, are a purchase price of $150,000 with an appraisal to confirm um, that that value is there, allowing uh, the town to back out if it is not there. Um, and the posture, Mr. Chairman, is this. Uh, as you know, the only the town council can authorize this transaction. Um, the Conservation Commission came to me and um, asked that I bring this to the council um, on an informal basis, so before that formal consideration of whether to approve or not approve the transaction takes place, um, on the theory that if the if the council just does, isn't interested in doing this or doesn't um, or has a concern about it, um, now would be the time to uh, at least raise those initial concerns um, so that we could um, make an assessment about whether to devote resources to pursuing this project. Are we buying the land or are we buying an easement? My understanding is that uh, the discussions uh, have been around an easement. Um, I'm not sure if you have anything to add to that. The easement is consistent with what we have already on the rest of the Merrill Farm, and this would um, facilitate additional protection of the agricultural capabilities of the farm and prevent you know, encroaching development. And then a little side bonus is that the New England cottontails that were um, living at S Stonyfield Farm have moved to Merrill Farm. So it would be a, a nice thing to protect that habitat for those endangered species. I don't think anybody has any objection no, to buying the land. I mean, we just, I think it's just a matter of whether it's an easement or it's a purchase. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know both sides. Certainly. I, 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 if, uh, again, uh, with, with the council's approval, I'm happy to um, you know, take, a, take more of a, a leading role on this. If the appraisal comes back higher or much higher, more than what the town is willing to offer, where do we sit in that situation? So um, the way that we've structured these transactions in the past is take, for instance, um, Lithia Springs. Lithia Springs is a parcel that we came to terms uh, with the landowner on a certain price. The appraisal came back higher, um, and the way it was structured was the seller had to, under the purchase and sales agreement, honor the uh, agreed upon price mm -hmm. um, and my recommendation to the council and to the conservation commission would be um, that we continue to uh, observe that practice in negotiating purchase and sales agreements going forward yeah i think we just probably want to know our options between purchase and easement yeah 
just get a you know get a feel for that. I don't disagree with the Conservation Commission's assessment of that the Merrill Farm is an easement. I'm just thinking the council just probably wants at least to Certainly. have the information. Certainly. I, I'm happy to um, drill drill down onto that. Just yes. In case you have questions, the Merrills are here tonight okay. if you have some questions for them. Hi, my name is Ken Merrill. Um, I'm of the 587 Mammoth which is the address for this parcel, and I'm also co-owner of the Merrill Farm. Um, Hi, Ken, how are you? I haven't seen you in a number of years, so I hope you're well. <laughs> yeah, well, we're here because we'd like to get your opinion on whether we can work together to try to preserve this parcel, to, in a, essence, add it to the conservation area that already exists. It's a rather small parcel, but it, completes and really makes what we already have there uh, a total conservation area. I don't think there's any doubt from what I read of the council right. that they want to work together. Yeah, right. yeah. They just want to figure out whether or not they want, yeah, and just want to see, so if an easement's worth X, just buying it outright is worth what, and just and just make a decision. Yeah, well, we, we have contracted with an appraiser, and hopefully sometime in September we will get answers to that question but um i think tonight we're just looking for a sense of would you like to proceed would you like to negotiate it's I, a negotiation i, 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 I we, think the answer is yes yes, yes do we yes. start a negotiation and answer some of these questions like is it better to for the town to buy it or is it better to just add a conservation easement similarly structured to what's already there i think we're in complete agreement with you yes. because we'd like we'd like to work together with you to absolutely protect a very special mm. parcel I mean this parcel hasn't had any type of development on it for 200 years or more since since the sheep ate all the the, the trees off Merrill Hill no I think we're in agreement that we mm -hmm. want to work together absolutely absolutely yeah because uh, as we're starting any negotiation it's an open book it's an open slate Let's have everybody throw their their ideas in, and let's see what we can agree on. Terrific. Sounds, Sounds great. Thank you thank very you. much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's all I have on that item, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Good. Anything else? All right, so why don't we proceed working with conservation and with the Merrills and see what we can work out. Certainly. Thank you. Okay, final 13. Um, I'll accept a motion to waive the reading for ordinance 2023-03. So moved. Second. All right. First reading is of the we're even first reading today. Uh, public hearing will be on August 14th. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes affirmative. And we'll see you on August 14th for the amendment to the zoning ordinance relative to the rezoning map of lot 15, map 15, lot 236. Okay, um, I'll accept the motion to approve the minutes for uh, the June 5th Town Council meeting and the June 21st Special Town Council meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Your vote's affirmative. Meetings are, uh, minutes are accepted. Pickable pieces done. Um, any liaison reports? I'll be real quick. Uh, Budget Committee had a great tour of the Police Department given by the Chief. Everyone really appreciated him, so thank you, Chief, for doing that. Um, Justin Campo came and described the budget process. We've got a few new members on the on the budget committee, so they appreciated Justin doing that. And the chair, Patrick, wanted me to remind everybody that there's one opening on the budget committee, and he'd like to get that filled as soon as possible since budget season's approaching. And any, I'm sorry, do we have any applications? We did have one application, I believe. Um, um, I was uh, told no, um, but I, I could certainly be stand to be corrected on that. My Why don't we is, repost it? Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yep. that's yes. And then as far as solid waste, uh, they just want to remind that there's two openings on solid waste if anyone's interested. Yeah, I think long term we're looking to bring solid waste and utility together. So okay. I don't know if we're going to do that now, okay, but I mean, just 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 sort of say. That's fine. Uh, we had planning board last week, uh, an exciting meeting with uh, New Balance moved forward, was approved. 
Um, I think it'll be a very exciting new addition to town and a landmark, um, certainly for the town, but also for the state. And certainly there was some great um, commentary by the VP of New Balance for the econ economy of Londonderry and the surrounding region. And I think it'll be uh, lasting effects of his words for our region. Anything else? School board, uh, they had contracted with an uh, organization or a company out of Boston called PLC uh, to reevaluate the uh, special education needs within the school system, uh, do a, a study uh, of those uh, services provided. Uh, they also are reviewing their cell phone policy prior to their um, uh, dress code policy going to print. So. That's all I have. Anything else? Um, town manager report. I'll be very quick, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, uh, I had uh, some meetings, um, important meetings on water infrastructure. Um, Representative uh, Don and I met with Senator Carson and uh, Speaker Packard um, just uh, to talk about water issues. Um, this is something that um, I plan to talk uh, a lot about um, in in the coming meetings. Um, we've had consultations, as you know, Mr. Chairman, with the DES Commissioner. Um, you know, uh, there's a meeting coming up uh, that will involve uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and Representative Dunn uh, uh, at the Commissioner's office to talk about uh, some of these issues. Um, and uh, I just cannot thank our representatives in Concord um, enough for the $10 million, roughly, uh, that they have allocated through the budget to uh, get a, uh, a supply of water across the Merrimack River um, uh, to, to the east side of the river. Um, you know, that is an important um, step in this process to expand the availability of clean, safe, uh, drink, abundant drinking water in Londonderry. Um, there's work to be done, and the work um, can be visualized here. Um, We've, now, we've gotten the supply uh, to the east side of the river. That is a significant undertaking. Um, it's paid for. Uh, but what is not paid for is uh, getting the water to the Londonderry line. And you can see, you know, just um, uh, by my rough calculation, that's a distance of some four, four and a half miles. Um, that is uh, not going to be cheap. Um, and we are working right now to assemble a, uh, a funding package uh, that will hopefully include federal money, state money, um, money potentially from others who might benefit from this program um, outside of Londonderry, um, and also uh, from Londonderry. Um, when we went into this uh, last budget season, um, I think that everybody was on the same page, that uh, Londonderry is certainly not going to have to pay for all of this or nearly all of it, but we should expect to uh, be a participant in the funding puzzle. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm just I'm going to emphasize at every opportunity the importance um, of getting this water to the London Dairy Line um, so that we can, um, you know, take, take the next step towards solving all of our water problems. Okay. Um, the council probably recalls I shared an article with you for the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. saying that um, I think it's 50% of the homes in the United States will be affected by PFAs. So when we go up to the state to see the commissioner, um, we, we may want to bring that article with us. It's, it's, it's alarming, and, and the percentages um, are among the highest in the country in Rockingham County. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really are ground zero, um, and it's okay. not going away by itself. That's why I want to make sure when we go up there, we go up with a, you know, all the information we oh, need. We're we'll ready. Absolutely. Hey, Mike, do you know if that pipeline has a path right now? No, or? indeterminate. Um, okay. There's a couple of different options. Um, I think that, I think DES may favor one versus the other, but I, I'm hoping to learn more about that when we go up um, sure. in the next uh, couple of weeks. Anything from you, Kelly? Two brief things. This morning I attended a Chamber of Commerce meeting focused on economic development. Um, so I gave an overview of what we have going on in London Dairy, such as New Balance. Um, that's something I'll be participating in going forward. And then wanted to inform the council that we've applied for the Invest New Hampshire funds. Um, so hopefully we'll receive some uh, and that will assist in updating our development regulations and zoning ordinance. 
Okay. Anything else from the council? I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Ladies and gentlemen, our next meeting is. Um, I'm sorry. Did you have something? I'm wondering if we're able to change the dates to go forward. I know consistently we're normally meeting the first and the third of the month. Are During we the able summer, to? We only meet once a month. I understand, but I know there's been some people questioning about. I know not all of us have a schedule that can always meet, but if we can try to stick more to our first and third Mondays. If we stay on the schedule we're on right now, yeah. which is the one I've given to the town, yes. is that um, we have Labor Day we have to skip over. Mm -hmm. And then we have, so that we should fall back in line before budget in October. Okay, great. But there's, I'm working around holidays. The last meeting had to be canceled because of vacations. Of course. So, you know, work, working around availability is, you know, what we've been doing. Okay, sounds good. But is the intent to be back on schedule for the budgets. Okay, great. Um, so right now, at this moment, the uh, and, and it may change. I guess will be the um, next meeting will be August fourteenth, twenty twenty three. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um, those opposed, and we are adjourned. Thank you.